Six years ago, prompted by the rise of Dr. Jordan Peterson, I began work on a book called The Order of Chaos, An Antidote to Meaning, releasing each chapter on YouTube as I wrote it. Now, I fully intended for it to be a 10 to 12 chapter tome, but I only ended up writing four chapters because it only took that long to say what I wanted to say. However, just because the project didn't go on as long as I originally intended it to doesn't mean that I don't stand by it or the philosophy outlined within it. Therefore, I have elected to present it here in its entirety with this brief new forward. In retrospect, I regret my candor about my reasons for writing The Order of Chaos, because by framing my book as nothing more than a response to Peterson, I limited the scope of the project, and as a result, many viewed the book through the wrong lens. The point of The Order of Chaos was not merely to refute Peterson. My ambitions were a good bit broader than that. When Friedrich Nietzsche, a man admired by myself and Peterson alike, made the most profound philosophical statement of the 19th century, God is dead, he identified something that we still grapple with even 141 years later, that a consequence of the Enlightenment is that traditional religion will no longer be the dominant force in Western society. Nietzsche recognized that this would entail a complete reevaluation of all hitherto established beliefs, values, morals, and social norms. And in the wake of this reevaluation, Nietzsche and Peterson share a fear, the fear of the N-word. Not that one. The one I'm referring to is nihilism. Nietzsche's fear about nihilism was not just about the absence of meaning, but also about the potential responses to the vacuum. He worried that nihilism could lead to pessimism, decay, and a passive resignation to meaninglessness. So to solve the problem of nihilism, Nietzsche believed that we must embrace what he termed the will to power, which he saw as an individual's struggle to assert and expand their own influence to the greatest degree possible. In keeping with this idea, Nietzsche posited the necessity of a new human ideal, the ubermensch, the overman, the individual who creates their own values and meaning rather than relying on external sources of affirmation such as religion, tradition, culture, and the like. Uh, he further saw that human beings could achieve this transformation through art. Thus, through art, we could defeat the despair of nihilism. Now, Peterson also has some solutions to the problem of nihilism, some of them echoing Nietzsche, others diverging pretty wildly. Peterson agrees with Nietzsche that in a post-God era, we must strengthen our individuality and discover meaning for ourselves, but Peterson places a far greater emphasis on preserving the established social norms and traditions, rejecting Nietzsche's more radical approach of complete social reevaluation. So whereas Nietzsche sees the death of God as an opportunity for growth, Peterson sees it as this terrifying, unintended consequence of the Enlightenment that we should somehow strive to overcome. If Nietzsche says God is dead, Peterson says God is dead, but we can bring him back to life somehow in some new form if we really, really try. Peterson cautions that if we fail to resurrect God, the fabric of Western society will simply come undone. We will realize Dostoevsky's fear that without God, everything is permissible. Peterson pisses in his little panties in terror at the idea of a world in which all traditional values have fallen by the wayside and the ultimate skepticism of postmodernism ushers in an age of post-truth where reality basically becomes whatever it needs to become to justify the transient desires of the now. Peterson ultimately is just a regressive, and he's not the only one. There's a great many people who pine not for a better future, but a return to some mythologized past. They may not have Peterson's intellect, but they see on some rudimentary level the same thing he sees. The ironic thing about Peterson is that he himself is a postmodernist, but he wants to use the weapon of postmodernism to undo postmodernism. His logic goes something like this. 
if God is dead, then nihilism is true. If nihilism is true, then we can create our own reality. If we can create our own reality, then we can create a reality in which God is not dead, but God is alive. And if God is alive, then nihilism is defeated. Those who view Peterson as a mere grifter are not necessarily incorrect, but they're underestimating the guy. His strategy for regressing humanity back to a more traditional, read primitive state is actually quite brilliant. But enough about Jordan Peterson. Let's talk about my favorite subject, me. Because I have seen what both Peterson and Nietzsche have failed to see. That nihilism is not some terror to be overcome, but simply a truth to be embraced. In the same way that the new atheists easily defeated the traditional God through simple reductionism, we can also easily defeat the shambling zombie of God that Peterson and his ilk hold up to us as some sort of restorative tonic. But we must first have the intellectual courage to admit the truth that every single one of us has already realized, but which some of us fight against out of fear. The concept of meaning, meaning itself, is every bit as irrational as the concept of a bearded man on a throne who sits up in heaven and watches over all of us in judgment. Nietzsche gave us God is dead. Peterson wants to tell us God is dead, but we can bring him back. And I'm here to tell you God is dead, but not dead enough. It's time to kill him further. Nietzsche foresaw figures like Peterson when he stated, after Buddha was dead, his shadow was still shown for centuries in a cave, a tremendous, gruesome shadow. God is dead, but given the way of men, there may still be caves for thousands of years in which his shadow will be shown, and we, we still have to vanquish his shadow, too. This is the true essence of the order of chaos. It's not about Jordan Peterson. It's not about Friedrich Nietzsche. It's not even about T.J. Kirk. It's about vanquishing the shadow. The Order of Chaos, an antidote to meaning. Introduction. A word about Jordan Peterson. I assume that most of you have heard of Jordan Peterson. He's hard to miss these days. A really popular guy. His new book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, is a smash hit that supplanted Michael Wolff's Trump expose, Fire and Fury, from the top of the bestseller lists. He's recently done several high-profile interviews, including one where he verbally annihilated Kathy Newman of Channel 4 News in a devastating clip that garnered millions of views on YouTube. I've only recently started to turn my eye on Peterson. I've been aware of him for a while and the small cult growing around him, but it never seemed to warrant my full attention. Recently, however, I took a plunge. I bought my very own copy of Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Let's talk about it. I've made no secret of the fact that I don't think much of Peterson. And in response to that, I was told by several people that I dismiss people like Peterson too quickly because of his ties to religion. For those unfamiliar with Peterson's beliefs, he draws a lot of his morality from the Bible, and he sees it as the founding text of Western civilization. His belief in a literal God is doubtful, but he holds a metaphorical god in high regard, much as a Levian Satanist holds the metaphorical Satan in high regard. Peterson's affinity for Christianity is only one facet of my profound disagreements with the man. I'd go so far as to say that if Peterson never mentioned God or the Bible once in his book, the rest of what he wrote would still find plenty of opportunities to rub me the wrong way. If you can forgive me a dirty simile, his thoughts are as sloppy as a hooker's pussy at the end of her shift, or at the end of your shaft. Let me be clear on something. Peterson is a very intelligent man. There's no denying that. He's got a good grasp of evolutionary psychology and a good grasp of psychology in general. 
No one can deny that he's a fast talker and a fast thinker. No one can deny that he's well-read and that his academic achievements are every bit as impressive as his newfound celebrity status as a public intellectual. Let me go back to the day I bought his book. I was at an airport in Ohio, heading back to Louisiana after a long and frustrating business negotiation. I've never been blessed enough to be able to sleep on an airplane, so I was looking on Audible for an audiobook to listen to on the long flight home, and I saw Jordan Peterson's book there, uh, read by Peterson himself. I thought to myself, what the hell? Let's see what all the fuss is about. Let's see what's got so many so impressed and so enamored. Honestly, up until that point, I'd never really given the guy a fair shake. I dismissed him on a very superficial basis. So I decided in that moment to recognize and let go of my bias. I wanted to go into his book with an open mind. Part of me was hoping that Peterson's sycophants were right. Part of me was hungry for another Hitchens, for another forceful and eloquent intellectual who could demolish the bullshit of the day with a wrecking ball of aggressively dispensed insight. And indeed, that's how Peterson has been marketed to us. That's how he's marketed himself. The plane boarded. I took my seat and I began listening. I had six hours of travel ahead of me, including a layover in Atlanta, and I had absolutely nothing better to do. So I listened. And as I listened, I felt an increasing sense of dread. Could the man I was listening to really be a hero to millions of disenfranchised people? Was this man really who some were championing as the new voice of reason in a confusing and bitterly embattled world? Something strange began to happen, a transfiguration or maybe a crystallization. The more Peterson spoke, the more I started to see myself more clearly through the lens of my revulsion with his philosophy. It was as if everything I believed in had been turned inside out and written into a book. And I thought to myself, I must attack this book. I must destroy this man. It became an imperative in my mind, a need, raw and ugly. Only a few days after my flight, I wrote a video script attempting to do just that. Must destroy Peterson! That was the mantra in my head as I wrote, but when I looked at the script a few days later with new eyes, I recognized that it was not nearly as strong as I wanted it to be. And I didn't truly have any idea how to fix it, or even a clue within my soul as to what exactly was wrong with it. So I set it aside and decided to contemplate it for a while. Sometimes an idea needs time to brew. Striking while the iron is hot is not always the wisest course of action. Sometimes it's best to let passions cool and view things anew through colder and more calculating eyes. Weirdly enough, it was a pro-Peterson meme that I stumbled upon one day on Instagram that helped me realize the problem with the script that I had written. Nothing matters, bruh! Nihilism does not produce freedom from exclusion. It just makes everyone excluded, and that is an intolerable state, directionless, uncertain, chaotic, and angst-ridden. When such uncertainty reaches a critical level, the counter-response appears. First the unconscious and then the collectively expressed demand for a leader possessed by the spirit of totalitarian certainty who promises above all to restore order. Thus a society without a unifying principle oscillates unmoored between nihilism and totalitarianism. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! This is an actual Peterson quote from a message he posted on his website a little over a year ago in a post entitled, My New Year's Letter to the World. And it's this quote pulled by the terrible meme I showed you a moment ago that really got me thinking about Peterson himself in a new light. 
He warns us that in the vacuum created by nihilism, people will gravitate towards a charismatic authoritarian who will show them the way. And I think that in this instance, Peterson was right. What he failed to realize, however, or at least failed to divulge, is that he's currently benefiting from exactly this fact. Over the past year or so, I've seen many people who were or are part of the new atheist movement gravitate towards Peterson and his message. Peterson's message, by the way, amounts to little more than a delusion of grandeur. Peterson's book stands before the world and proclaims, Hey, you nihilistic loser, the wisdom contained in this book can bring order to chaos. I, Jordan, the chosen one, Peterson, can help you cure that nasty sense of directionless malaise that's got you down. You see, it all stems from the nihilism that new atheism and postmodernism has left in its wake. Peterson has a list of 12 rules that you should follow to bring about paradise on earth by defeating nihilism and postmodernism. In other words, Peterson is a leader possessed by the spirit of totalitarian certainty who promises above all to restore order. He is the very thing he warns us of, but he masquerades as the opposite. He tells you, I'm not the authoritarian who wants to rigidly control you. I'm just a guy with a book of rules that you should obey. And you're supposed to nod your head and pretend that you see a difference. In the past, I have primarily taken on two groups of people. The religious, both the zealots and the moderates, and the so-called social justice warriors, SJWs. The former group was basically dead when I got there, hanging on by a fraying thread of tradition, waning in influence, and on their last legs. Uh, The latter group was so patently ridiculous that arguing against their positions felt like child's play, more of an amusing distraction than a serious intellectual exercise. For both of these foes, I primarily employed the tactics of reductionist deconstruction and crude mockery, And those tools were more than adequate for the task at hand. But Peterson and his acolytes of order are not so easily destroyed by those tools. His philosophy is dense and deceptively subtle. Direct deconstruction of Peterson's philosophy would be a massive undertaking that would ultimately not be effective for the following reason— People have not come to Peterson because he makes sense. He, he doesn't. They've come to Peterson because he's offering them something that nihilism inherently cannot offer. Purpose. A prepackaged, no thoughts required reason for being. And as the great James Randi once said, those who believe without reason cannot be convinced by reason. Mockery, too, would be an insufficient tool to defeat Peterson and his ilk. He can certainly be mocked, and I've seen it done. For instance, AIU made a frankly hilarious video about Peterson's inability to answer a very simple question regarding his belief or lack of belief in God. Peterson flatly refuses to answer the question directly, but instead engages in Bill Clinton-level subterfuge, asking for basic words and concepts to be defined for him before he can possibly give the answer. Uh, But AIU's video, hilarious though it was, did not garner a warm reception. Mockery of the religious and the SJWs was easy and effective. And most importantly to YouTubers like me, it was popular. Uh, Religion is a soft target for mockery because it's archaic and even the people who believe it don't really believe it. It's a vestigial meme of the past that's too stupid to know it's dead. Just a tired, anachronistic remnant holding on by its fingernails due only to an ever-shrinking sense of obligation to traditional values that exist within certain people. Mockery's always been effective against SJWs because they exist to be mocked. 
Their stupidity at this point is legendary, and despite the best efforts of nearly every form of mainstream media outlet to push an SJW agenda, the ideas championed by social justice warriors have, by and large, not caught on with the general populace. Peterson's adherents are different than religious folks and SJWs. They're not stodgily clinging to his ideas out of a sense of uh, dying obligation as religious devotees are, Uh, nor are they just completely buffoonish idiots like SJWs are. Peterson's adherents are people who feel as if they are hopelessly adrift in a sea of existential nihilism, uh, who feel that life had no purpose until they were passionately moved by Peterson and his ideas. Religious people believe out of fear and obligation. SJWs believe whatever emotionally caters to their endless sense of entitlement. Peterson's acolytes believe in his message for reasons that are far more pure. They possess a genuine passion and desire to save not only themselves, but the world. Save it from what, you might ask? Well, from chaos, of course. The chaos of... Nihilism, postmodernism, atheism, skepticism, empiricism, materialism, or whatever word or words you want to use to encompass your negative feelings about the detached jadedness and divisiveness of our times. And so my usual wheelhouse of deconstruction and mockery will have to take a back seat on this journey. Jordan Peterson is forcing me to do something I've long toyed with the idea of, but never actually attempted. For my entire career, I have shared with you many of my thoughts, but rarely have I let you into my thought process. I have conducted myself by a very particular philosophy, but it is a philosophy that I've never elucidated directly, and that must now change. Peterson has laid out an architecture for how you should be. He's offered you a lens through which to view your reality. He has given you a philosophy not only in the academic sense, but in the colloquial sense as well. And so anyone who truly wants to defeat Peterson must begin by doing as Peterson has done, by laying all of their cards on the table. He has given people a way of seeing the world, And it is not sufficient to simply say to them, that way of seeing the world is wrong. You must give them a different way to see it. And that's exactly what I will henceforth be endeavoring to do in however many videos or chapters it takes. This video represents the introduction of an audio book that I will be releasing bit by bit to YouTube and other platforms as time allows. Uh, The title of this book, which I will eventually release in paperback form as well, is The Order of Chaos, An Antidote to Meaning. And so, I welcome you all to my mind. I will give you every tool in my intellectual toolbox. I will give you every lens I have through which to look at this world and its happenings. And maybe when all is said and done, you will find no worth in any of it. And you'll be just as eager to criticize me as I was to criticize Peterson. Uh, I cannot promise you enlightenment because I don't have it. I cannot promise you purpose for the same reason. All I can offer you is my honest assessment of life and how I choose to conduct myself as a result of this assessment. I will not, as Peterson does, be prescriptive and issue authoritarian edicts. The contents of this book you will have to take or leave at your own discretion. Nothing contained herein should be perceived as a rule for living. Think of them instead as tools for being, tools that you can pick up and use or discard with prejudice. It's worth noting that although Peterson galvanized my desire to write this book, its primary purpose is not to subvert him. It is my hope that by showing you the inner workings of my mind and giving you insight into my value system, you will gain better insight not only into my videos, but into your own lives. 
It is my wish to show all of you the profound beauty of nihilism, the freedom of it, the sheer joy of not being forever tethered to someone else's idea of a higher purpose or to a manufactured, grander meaning of life. This book is meant as an exaltation of freedom and a love letter to meaninglessness, to hopelessness, to life without a rigidly defined sense of purpose. I hope very much that it will bring you contentment or at the very least stimulate you in some capacity. Shall we begin? Chapter one, Our Friend Chaos. You know know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. Even if the plan is horrifying. If tomorrow I tell the press that, like, a gangbanger will get shot, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics, because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one little old mayor will die, well, then everyone loses their minds. Jordan Peterson's book begins with an examination of order and chaos, so it seems proper that mine should do the same. Though Peterson is primarily obsessed with Christian symbolism, he begins his book with a meditation on a piece of Eastern symbolism, the yin-yang symbol. He likens the dark and feminine yin to chaos and the bright and masculine yang to order. This is Peterson's personal read of this symbol, not the traditional Taoist take on yin and yang, which holds to the notion that both of these essential forces of existence emerged from the creative fires of chaos and each represent their own form of order, especially when placed in conjunction with one another. As we examine the yin-yang symbol, we notice that in yin, there is a speck of yang, and yang, a speck of yin. Peterson interprets this aspect of the symbol as saying that within chaos, there is the potential for order to emerge and vice versa. But in fact, the intent behind the symbol was to show that darkness and light are inexorably connected in the same way that front and back are opposites, yet they are connected because everything that has a front has a back. Up and down are opposites, yet they are connected because everything that has a top has a bottom. Darkness and light are similarly connected in Taoist philosophy. I don't personally subscribe to this notion because darkness can certainly exist without light. In fact, being without light is the very definition of darkness. Uh, But the point is still taken. It's as my friend, author Howard Bloom, is fond of saying, opposites are joined at the hip. In philosophy, this is called dialectical monism or dualistic monism, the notion that reality exists as a unified whole, but human perception or perhaps some other force splits existence into a series of dichotomies. The reason that yin and yang are in such balance and the reason they each contain a seed of their opposite is to show us that the separation between them is nothing but an illusion. Darkness and light in Taoism are not opposite forces, but two pieces of one force working in beautiful tandem with one another. But as George Carlin pointed out on his 14th album and 8th HBO special, Jammin' in New York, we should leave symbols to the symbol-minded. The Taoist interpretation of the yin-yang symbol is no more relevant than Peterson's interpretation or my own. It's just a symbol. It doesn't necessarily contain any greater truth about reality. The best it can claim to do is promulgate reflection on certain aspects of existence, introspections that will perhaps come to worthwhile conclusions or set of conclusions, but could just as likely lead only to folly. In Peterson's case, his interpretation strikes me as absolutist and almost childish. I've said before that Peterson is deceptively subtle, but there's nothing subtle about his take on yin and yang, or his take on order and chaos, for that matter. He truly is among the ranks of the symbol-minded folks that George Carlin warned us about. Though Peterson does occasionally in his books pay lip service to the power of chaos and even alludes to ways in which chaos and order work in tandem, for the most part he is obsessed with drawing a line in the sand between the two concepts and taking a moral stance on each of them. The title of his book tells you as much as it purports to be an antidote to chaos. Listen to the way he describes order in the introduction, or overture as he calls it, to his book. 
Order is where uh, people around you act according to well-understood social norms and remain predictable and cooperative. It's the world of social structure, explored territory, and familiarity. And here how, here's how he describes uh, chaos. Chaos, by contrast, is where or when something unexpected happens. Chaos is what is, emerges when you suddenly find yourself without employment or are betrayed by a lover. These sentiments are hammered home again and again in his book. Order equals goodness and stability. Chaos equals badness and uncertainty. He makes occasional exceptions to this otherwise rigid dichotomy, but the prevailing narrative is one of simplistic caveman logic. Order good, chaos bad. Let me present you with a very different notion of what order and chaos are. One that is more in line with, the da- with what the Taoists intended with their yin-yang symbol, not that it really matters. Before we begin, it should be noted that concepts as broad as these often boil down to subjective interpretation. One man's order is another man's chaos. That's why I chose to proceed this chapter with a line from Heath Ledger's Joker, written by Jonathan and Christopher Nolan in their Saturn Award-winning screenplay for The Dark Knight. I think you will find that subjectivity is among the major themes of this book, and order and chaos are subjective in many of the ways they impact human life. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no objective notions of order and chaos, uh, however. It simply means that order and chaos are terms that can be defined subjectively or objectively, depending on the context. Objective chaos is most easily defined as randomness, uh, that which has no pattern, no rules, no method, A Jackson Pollock painting is chaos. Uh, The paint is spattered about at random, non-representational, depicting nothing in particular, and created without any regard for composition or form. Uh, Nitpickers might point out at this point that this was only during Pollock's uh, drip period and that some other eras of his work did place more emphasis on composition and representation, uh, to which I can only exasperatedly sigh fine. Uh, But here we're talking about the iconic drip and spatter style of painting that he made famous and that made him famous. Objective order is the opposite. Uh, It is predictable, deliberate, and has a definable pattern, a method, a discernible structure. A Leonardo da Vinci painting is order. The paint is carefully arranged on the canvas to create a composition that represents the subject of the painting in a recognizable way. Like no one looks at the Mona Lisa and says, what the hell is this supposed to be? It's a woman wearing an enigmatic smile and human beings with eyes and a few brain cells can cobble that information together. But we're not really here to talk about objective order and chaos. We're here to talk about the subjective ways these concepts enter into our lives and how one man's order is another man's chaos and vice versa. I think you'll find that this proposition is a great deal more difficult and complicated than just laying the blame for everything bad that happens in your life at the feet of chaos and crediting everything good to order, as Peterson too often does. One of Peterson's examples of chaos is finding yourself suddenly unemployed. But perhaps to the employer who fired you, this represents order. Perhaps your former boss is saying, I'm glad we fired that lazy son of a bitch. Now we can get the company back on track. You know, to you, this decision is chaos, representing financial and other personal uncertainties. To your employer or your former employer, this decision uh, is order, representing the potential for a more prosperous and better staffed business. Peterson also likens chaos to being betrayed by a lover. But perhaps from that lover's perspective, this is a stride towards order. Perhaps he or she is saying, I've finally taken my life back from that controlling narcissist, and now I can finally be happy again. 
to you, the breakup might represent the sorrow of the ending, but to your lover, it may represent the thrill of a new beginning, the chance to establish a better order in their lives. Perhaps in both of these examples, the contrast is not really so much between your chaos uh, versus their order, but your harmful chaos versus their beneficial chaos. But we'll get more into that in a moment. From an even broader perspective, being fired by a company or being dumped in a relationship are both part of a larger structure of order. A company that didn't have the option to fire people who wouldn't or couldn't perform their duties would be in perpetual chaos. A company must be free to fire those who cannot perform their job duties adequately because otherwise they're at the mercy of bad employees. So the ability to fire people is built into the structure, the order of every company on earth because it's an absolutely vital ability to have if you want a stable and prosperous business. A worker who cannot perform his or her duties is a detriment. The ability to fire people is not a byproduct of chaos, but a pillar of order. Of course, to the person being fired, it is chaos. They had a job and a steady paycheck to rely on, and now they don't have those things any longer. You know, they might begin to wonder with some alarm, uh, where's their ne next meal going to come from and how their bills are going to be paid and how they're going to indulge in the luxuries to which they're accustomed. But meals and bills and luxuries requiring money is also part of an established order. Capitalism. The point, if you're you know still not getting it, is that your personal chaos is often the byproduct of strictly regimented systems of order, which raises the question, does this work in the opposite direction as well? Personal chaos can be a symptom of larger order, so can personal order also be a symptom of larger chaos? Well, let's ask those situated in the heart of the military-industrial complex who make vast personal fortunes from exploiting the chaos of war. Let's ask those rare souls who have won their fortunes in games of random chance like the lottery. Let's ask those authors who see the chaos of the modern world and write books claiming to be the antidote to chaos and who subsequently make a fortune off the disheartened and disenfranchised who seek a remedy to the personal chaos that has engulfed their lives. Clever exploiters and lucky dupes alike have been the benefactors of chaos since the dawn of man and probably before that as well. But that's only the most superficial way in which human beings have benefited from chaos. Life itself has climbed a ladder of chaos to reach new heights of order. Even Peterson is forced to concede this in his first chapter where he probes the depths of evolutionary psychology rather expertly in what I consider to be the best and least infantile part of his book. One of the principal engines of evolution is random genetic mutation. You know, genes are not supposed to mutate. They're supposed to perfectly replicate themselves in a predictable manner. And 29,999,999 times out of 30 million, they do. But one in every 30 million times during the passing of genes from one generation to the next, a baseline pair mutates. This means that there are about 100 to 200 new mutations from one generation of humans to the next. The vast majority of these mutations are neutral mutations that have neither negative nor positive effects on the organism they occurred within. Other mutations are harmful and cause genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis or hereditary cancers. Other mutations are beneficial and actually lead to an organism being better adapted to its environment. And without beneficial mutations, the process of evolution would be impossible. In other words, without the chaos of certain genes failing to replicate themselves accurately, the higher orders of life that exist in abundance today would not be possible. If genes never yielded to chaos and always replicated themselves perfectly, then life never would have evolved beyond its most primitive state a prokaryotic cell more primitive than any that exists today, little more than a bit of RNA 
floating around in a lipid membrane, basically a self-replicating soap bubble filled with genetic material. The title of this book, The Order of Chaos, sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. Order owes a great debt to chaos because chaos can do something that order cannot do. It can pull off the great material miracle of creation. The Taoists were correct when they said that yin and yang and all the dichotomies they represent were born out of the creative fires of chaos. Earlier, I likened a Jackson Pollock painting to chaos and a Da Vinci painting to order. And in the context of that analogy, it was accurate. But from a broader perspective, they are both children of chaos. You know, paintings are now part of the established order of existence. We understand them and we understand their purpose. But there was a time, just a blink of an eye ago, on the cosmic time scale, when paintings were not part of the natural order. The first paintings were made on the walls of caves and were made with dirt or charcoal mixed with spit or with animal fat. Dirt, charcoal, spit, animal fat, cave walls, all of these things existed long before human beings were even dreamed of by Mother Nature. They each had their own place in the natural order of the world, and if a sentient observer had existed to study them, he or she would have safely predicted what each of them would do and what each of them would be within the order of nature. It wasn't until mankind arrived on the scene and began using their big brains, which once again evolved by climbing the ladder of chaos, to repurpose these natural elements into something unpredictable. Cave walls became canvases. Dirt, charcoal, spit, and fat became paint. And humankind began to express itself through representational art. This was chaos. It was not the predictable. It was not the way things had always been. It was not hitherto part of the established order. When Jordan Peterson defined order in part as being the predictable, he was making a bold admission about what chaos really is. Something new. Something that upsets that order. And just as genetic mutations can be neutral, beneficial, or harmful, so too can all the creations of chaos. I personally think that painting is a wonderful example of beneficial chaos. It was something that rewrote the rules of reality in an unforeseeable way that bucked the established pattern of the world. And thanks to it, we have... Uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night and Klimt's The Kiss and Picasso's Guernica and so on. All that which is new to this world and which could not have been predicted by precedent is a form of chaos. And just as life has benefited from the continued meddling of chaos, so too has art. We aren't still painting on cave walls. We've moved past even the need for a physical canvas and paints thanks to softwares like Adobe Photoshop, Corel Painter, and a slew of others. And who knows what new leaps in visual art will stun us in the future. Technology is always improving. Human beings are still up to their old tricks of taking that which exists in one form and repurposing it into something new, something that defies the extant order, something inherently and magically chaotic. Sometimes the new creations are not useful and they fade away benignly. Other times they're beneficial and become incorporated into a new order. Or at least, you know, until they're replaced by some new radical departure from the norm. Brought to you once again by our good friend Chaos. But if Chaos is our friend, then why does it have such a shabby reputation? All of us have said during a tumultuous time that, you know, my life is in chaos right now. If a room is messy and it's not functional, we say sheepishly to a friend who sees it, oh, I'm sorry, my my room's in chaos right now. 
If people are rioting in the streets and violence is breaking out and fires are being set and cars are being flipped and utter bedlam is broken out in every conceivable way, we are apt to describe the situation with the word chaos. And in none of those examples are we misusing the word. All of these situations are, in fact, chaos. And it's this chaos that Jordan Peterson likely sees his book as being the antidote to. Peterson has developed a catchphrase of sorts that has resonated and caught on with many of the disenfranchised people who have come to him. Clean your room, bucko. Clean your room. Such a simple phrase. The same kids who likely ignored it when it came from their parents are now championing it as great philosophical wisdom now that it comes to them from Peterson. And here is what it means, according to Peterson in an interview with ABC Comedy's Tonightly with Tom Ballard. If you're going to fix complicated problems, you have to learn how to fix simple problems first. Then you get good at it. I'm not saying that young people don't have things to be concerned about because life is a concern, right? I mean, it, life is a fatal disease. It's a concern. You're not on top of it. There's always more challenge than you can take on in some sense. But complaining about the structure of being and attempting to reorganize massive social structures, especially when you don't know the first thing about them, which is generally the case, is just not advisable. And the universities, you know, they teach young kids, young people, 19, 20 years old, that they should be out attempting to rectify massive social organizations. It's like, you wouldn't go and try to fix a cruise ship. You know, things are complicated. You can't set, it, set your own room in order. You can't set your own family, your life in order. What the hell makes you think you're ready to take on something like the political system? That's hard. You're gonna mess it up, man, for sure. It sounds so reasonable, doesn't it? Too bad it's completely wrong. The people throughout history who have made an impact, who have changed the world for better or for worse, have never done so by cleaning their room, but by messing it up. Remember that angry mob I mentioned in my example of harmful chaos, the throngs of people turning over cars, breaking windows, setting fires, and throwing a massive tantrum? Let me ask you this. What are they saying? Are they saying we are through with order and now we want nothing but chaos? No, probably not. What they're saying is, we are tired of the order that exists now, and we demand a new order. We demand an order more in line with what we want the world to be. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X had very different approaches to the problems faced by black people in America mid-20th century. But one thing they shared in common was they did not care about disrupting the established order. Why would they? It was an order that disadvantaged them for the color of their skin. It was an order that, to them, was evil. It deserved to be disrupted. It deserved to be challenged. The result of their disruption was chaos, unquestionably. Yet, Few would look now at their actions and say, well, they both lost their lives in the chaos they created, and many people were hurt, many people were attacked by dogs or with fire hoses, many were jailed, many in the establishment were offended, many in the public were upset or confused, therefore what they did was bad. Most wouldn't now say that because we see in retrospect that what they did produced results. Malcolm X, though a radical, though an extremist, though naive to the point of not knowing what socialism was when asked about it, though a deeply flawed human being, gave black people in America a deeper sense of pride. And many of those who suffered under racist tyranny 
believed that he addressed their grievances more accurately than did the civil rights activists of the time, who Malcolm found too limited in their approach. Malcolm X at one point described Martin Luther King as a chump and saw the civil rights movement as stooges for the white establishment. As for MLK, it was only days after his assassination that the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was passed. And this was during heavy rioting in reaction to his murder. The discrimination of blacks in America was part of an established order. Martin Luther King disrupted it with chaos. He was eventually assassinated, and this too was chaos. His death produced riots and outrage, more chaos. And then the system reacted with concession, the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And this was a new order. So we see chaos giving birth to order, then chaos disrupting that order, then chaos forcing a new order to emerge. I could write an entire chapter about the lives and the accomplishments of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. and their contrasting approaches, but for the purposes of this book, only these facts are important. One, both men were malcontents who opposed the established order of their times. Two, both men disrupted the established order with their speeches and protests causing great confusion and pandemonium. They used the power of chaos. Three, they changed the world into something more akin to how they thought it ought to be. And they didn't change the world by making sure their rooms were clean and by being respectful to order. They changed the world by causing havoc, disruption, and chaos. Their rooms were dirty, dirty rooms. Now, but but TJ, TJ, you're now saying, You've missed the point of Peterson's statement. He wasn't necessarily saying that a person who is opposed to the order of the day cannot work to change it. He was essentially saying that a person must have their own life in order before they attempt to start changing the world. Well, Martin Luther King Jr. may have been a great champion for civil rights, but he was also a plagiarist who was not at all faithful to his wife. The extent of his plagiarism and his infidelities is unknown, but few argue that they didn't happen. Imagine if Martin Luther King Jr. had said, well, I'm a flawed person. I've done some bad things. My life is not in perfect order, so how can I presume to lecture the world? How can I presume to change the world when I can't even change the bad things about myself? Imagine if he'd taken that tact. Maybe black people would still be drinking from the separate water fountains in places like my home state of Louisiana. Maybe they'd still be openly discriminated against in housing and in other areas. We cannot speculate as to alternate routes history might have taken since too many variables are present. But it's somewhat safe to say that in the absence of a world-changing man, the world would not have changed. Malcolm X may have imparted dignity and a strong belief in the right to self-defense to the black community, but he was also a convicted criminal who spent part of his adolescence in a mental hospital. When he was a member of the Nation of Islam, he was overtly racist, thinking of white people as devils and promoting black supremacy. Later in his life, he softened these stances and disavowed racism and the Nation of Islam, which is probably why three of its members riddled him with bullets. Uh, The point is, he was far from a perfect human being. His room wasn't clean, and his knowledge of the systems that he sought to change was far from perfect. It didn't stop him from speaking out, and much of what he said, I don't agree with. He believed in racism, in segregation, in the extinction of the white race. And in the midst of those times, to a white man like me, he would have been a frightening force. But through the cold lens of retrospect, I see these positions he took as largely a reaction, 
uh, of the disenfranchised to living in a world that was demonstrably stacked against them. I also view the hardline stance of Malcolm X as making the comparatively softer stances of Martin Luther King Jr. more palatable to white America. Even X himself seemed to realize this when he spoke to a crowd of uh, 300 Islamic students on December 10th, 1964. He said, I'll say nothing against Martin Luther King Jr., At one time, the whites in the United States called him a racialist, an extremist, and a communist. Then the black Muslims came along, and the whites thanked the Lord for Martin Luther King. Later in his life, Malcolm would come to believe that all races could live together in harmony. He believed, wrongly in my opinion, that Islam would be the ideology that could accomplish this, But whether I agree with Malcolm X or not isn't the point. The point is that he didn't wait for his room to be clean before he spoke out against the injustices that he perceived in the world. And as his views changed, so did what he preached to his people. And so those who followed his journey changed with him. He didn't wait until his ducks were all in a row. He got them in a row as he went, as best he could. And more than half a century after his death, his name and his legacy remain. For better or for worse, and that once again is relative, he changed the world. He didn't need perfect order in his life to change the order of the world. He didn't need perfect knowledge of the systems he was affecting in order to change those systems. Many of those who changed the course of history, not only used chaos as their tool, but had skeletons in their dirty rooms. Winston Churchill was a white supremacist prick who very few people actually liked, but he still led England through the darkest days of its history in World War II. John Lennon was an absentee father and wife beater, but he still wrote great songs and generated an enormous groundswell of support for peace activism. Thomas Jefferson was not only a slave owner, but he was also f***ing at least one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, and had numerous children by her. But he was still instrumental in laying down the foundational thoughts that defined what the United States of America would be as a country. Henry Ford was an anti-Semite, who bought the Dearborn Independent newspaper just to propagate his hatred of the Jews. But he still revolutionized industrial manufacturing with his ingenious vision of the assembly line. Aristotle was brutally misogynistic and thought women were little more than deformed men. But he was still among the most brilliant and foundational philosophers of all time. Einstein was a philanderer. Benjamin Franklin was a womanizer. Christopher Columbus was an absolute f***ing clueless dolt. This could go on ad nauseum. When you study the lives of influential people who change the course of history in some way, big or small, good or bad, finding someone with their shit together is a lot harder than you'd think. Jordan Peterson's directive to see to it that you have mastery over yourself before you attempt to change the world is not an antidote to chaos at all, but a paralytic agent that places you at the mercy of chaos. Because while you're trying to master yourself and clean your room, the world does not sit idly by and wait for you to find your bearings. It churns and morphs and fights and yields to the forces that act upon it. You haven't the time to wait until you're the master of yourself before you fight to change the world. If you take that tact, you will die still in pursuit of your own perfection and the world will not blink at your passage because you left no mark. You cannot always play defense. You cannot focus all of your energy on fortification of yourself and none of your energy on attacking that which you find unjust or incompetent. The truth as I see it is this. No one's room is actually clean. No one truly has an antidote for chaos and hopefully by now you've realized that's a good thing.
Chaos is not your enemy. It is your friend. Even when it hurts you, it is often reshaping your world in ways that history will ultimately deem were for the better. To wish for an antidote to chaos is to wish for a static world, an inert world, a world that cannot change. To think that you must be a perfect being with perfect knowledge before you can seek to change the world is not an idea supported by even the most cursory glance throughout history. Chaos can give birth to order, and chaos can change one system of order into a new system of order. We have seen that time and time again, but can order itself give birth to chaos? The American Civil War. What was it if not chaos? A country divided in two, brothers killing brothers to the tune of 620,000 deaths. More Americans died in the Civil War than died in Korea, Vietnam, World War I, and World War II combined. And yet, the chaos was born out of two conflicting ideas of order. It was the zenith of a conflict that existed since the formation of our country, tying back to the competing visions of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton for what this nation should be, with Hamilton pushing for centralized power under the rule of a strong federal government and Jefferson pushing for a looser affiliation of states with greater autonomy and more of a right towards self-determination. It wasn't until... Uh, nearly a century had passed that these competing ideas had it out with each other over the issue of slavery. The chaos of the Civil War was a battle to determine whose vision of order should exist. And Hamilton's vision won a hard-fought victory. Though the battle is still not truly ended, there are still those among us who hold more to Jefferson's ideal and despise the central power of the federal government. The point is that, yes, order can give birth to chaos, usually when there are two conflicting notions of what order should exist, but a system of order that is challenged neither by chaos nor a different order will not change itself. And even when two forms of order compete, they must each use the tool of chaos to achieve their ends as uh, Mr. Lincoln and his Union Army did, or as Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X did, as all of the world-changing figures and their legions have done throughout time. Order itself is never perfect. The founding documents of our own nation include a much-contested provision in the Bill of Rights called the Second Amendment. This provision states... A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, was the intent of the amendment to ensure that all Americans have the right to own guns or only that a well-regulated militia does? Was the intent of the amendment that guns cannot be regulated uh, does the amendment make sense in a modern context? After all, it was written in the time of muskets, not the age of AR-15s. These are questions that can be and have been examined elsewhere. The questions I'm interested in here are, why do these questions exist? Why does this debate exist? What has prompted this amendment to the Bill of Rights to come under such intense scrutiny? Few Americans would struggle to answer this question. The reason that gun control versus gun rights is one of the most hotly contested issues of our age is because of bad actors with guns, armed robbers, mass shooters, including school shooters, gang violence, high rates of gun suicide, gun homicide, and gun accidents. If not for these pockets of chaos... These events that are a threat to the orderly existence that people desire for themselves, this amendment would be as uncontroversial as most of the others. 
Once again, we see two competing visions of order. Shall we live in a society where the right to own guns remains unencumbered by law, or one in which gun ownership is regulated to some much greater degree or banned outright? Both positions represent order. The former order has been shown to contain within it elements of chaos, and the latter will surely contain chaos of its own. Uh, Though we strive towards order, chaos is always with us. And oftentimes, as we discussed earlier in this chapter, our chaos arrives in the form of another man's order. And no system of order can fully contain chaos. Allow guns, you see more gun violence. Ban guns, and you perhaps leave citizens without an ability to defend themselves against criminals and tyrants. We have lots of cliches ready to throw at such a predicament. Catch-22, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Pick your poison. The relationship between chaos and order is a complicated thing that touches on every facet of human existence and perhaps existence itself. The subjectivity of these concepts makes the relationship only more complex by orders of magnitude. But amidst the dizzying complexity, amidst the subjectivity, and amidst the cycles of chaos creating order and competing orders creating chaos and order using chaos to transform itself and people caught in the maelstrom trying to sort through the debris and find patterns of order when only chaos seemed to reign supreme amidst all of those things there is one truth that can be clung to one truth that is beyond dispute and beyond serious argument chaos cannot and should not be cured An antidote to chaos is an antidote to the new, an antidote to change, an antidote to progress. In other words, it's no antidote at all, but a poison that paralyzes humanity. Luckily for all of us, Peterson's book cannot cure chaos. It can only offer yet another idea of order, a vision of order that must compete against many others in a chaotic marketplace of ideas. Whether it can survive that marketplace will have very little to do with the true false merits of the ideas, but will be instead contingent on how successfully it stirs the human soul. People long for order, and so if you offer it to them, many will buy it. Chaos is a harder sell, because with chaos comes challenges. With chaos comes confusion, uncertainty, fear, and tribulation. But we can't hide from the powers of chaos, and I would argue that we shouldn't try. It has done more for us than I've seen many people frankly admit, and nothing has ever been gained from denying its power. I will close this chapter with two summarizing aphorisms. Number one, order provides the stabilities that we crave, but chaos creates the opportunities for change that we need. And number two, Those who are waiting for internal order will be the subjects of external chaos. Those who yield to internal chaos will be the architects of a new order. The Order of Chaos, An Antidote to Meaning, Chapter 2, The Art of Morality. There comes a time in every thinking person's life, usually in their teens, when they are struck, sometimes through a grim epiphany, sometimes through a slowly mounting aura of dread, by the utter meaninglessness of existence. It is never a comfortable moment, and all who experience it will deal with it differently. Often, it is our reaction to this first existential crisis that shapes and defines the rest of our lives. Some will entrench themselves in religious doctrine, searching for meaning in the bosom of a patriarchal creator figure who has bestowed them with life and who can also bestow that life with meaning. These people may become men or women of the cloth, or theologians, or at the very least develop an encyclopedic knowledge of the scriptures of their faith. 
Most of these people will walk through life with strong words of condemnation always spilling from their tongues. This is sinful. This is against God's will. This is an affront to my faith. They lob these sentiments as though they were Molotov cocktails of truth burning down the world of vice and sin. Others, when faced with the specter of nihilism, will engender themselves with a strong sense of civic pride and will set to work trying to right the wrongs of the world through political action. These people will become activists, politicians, social workers, teachers, or some manner of public servants. They will devote their lives to making the world a better place, though oftentimes they find themselves completely disenfranchised later in life when the enormity of their task begins to crush their youthful exuberance into the jaded antipathy of the defeated. Others will make it their life's goal to pursue knowledge, be it scientific knowledge or the musings of philosophers or the world of literature or whatever discipline best suits them. The only discipline that ever suited me was a few whips and chains in the bedroom. These people will become the vaunted intellectuals of society, the scientists, the engineers, the mathematicians, the historians, the writers, the philosophers, the architects, and so on. Most thinking people, when confronted with the unbearable weight of nihilistic reality and the existential crisis it prompts, will somewhere find a path that they hope will lead them away from meaninglessness and into the warm arms of purpose. Maybe the path is faith, maybe it's public service, maybe it's intellectual pursuits, or maybe it's something else entirely. But whatever the nature of the path may be, the purpose of the path is always the same an escape route from meaninglessness. When I was confronted with the meaninglessness of life, I was 14 years old. I was living in Washington State. My father was in federal prison in Texas for tax evasion and conspiracy to commit mail fraud. My stepfather, whom I consider to be a good man, was addicted to crystal meth, and his already hot-headed personality was exacerbated to the point of complete volatility. I will not relay the extent of his actions during this time, other than to say that they were a great tribulation for his family, myself included. He thankfully prevailed over his addiction after a few years and returned to his former self. My standoffish personality alienated me at home and at school. I had only one friend, a fellow fat kid named Jesse, who was a Star Wars geek with a lot of artistic talent. I had a crush on him, but it went unspoken and unexplored. He liked girls only, and I respected that, but it was still frustrating. I had no luck with guys or girls, both of which I was interested in. No one wanted my fat, zit-faced, awkward, standoffish, dismissive, asshole self to call their own. I can't imagine why not. It felt as if the trials of life were weighing heavily upon me, and it was impossible for me not to wonder to myself what purpose... Does any of this serve? Why am I trapped in this state of being? What has brought me and my family to these circumstances? Father gone, stepfather insane, hormones raging, skepticism checkmating all sentimentality, and a whole host of other problems that seemed huge then, but have faded into obscurity as time has healed their wounds. There were pragmatic answers to many of my questions, but they were not satisfying. Why was my father in jail? Because he didn't pay his taxes. Well, why didn't he pay his taxes? Because he was greedy and he deluded himself that he was invincible. Why did he feel that way? His ego was out of control. Why was his ego out of control? Because he had the ability to control and manipulate people. And after years of using it to great effect, he naively began to imagine that his powers were without limit. Why was he so effective at this manipulation and control? Because he was smarter than everyone else around him. So he was in jail because he was too smart and because he was too stupid. Useful realization? Maybe. Satisfying? Hardly. Why was my stepdad addicted to crystal meth? because it made him feel good and it gave him the energy to work long hours, which he needed to support his family. Why was all that weight on his shoulders? Because my dad, who used to take care of everyone, was no longer able to do so, and we've already explored the reasons why. No satisfaction there. 
No grand purpose, no divine plan, just a cocktail of human fallibility. Just a shitty world that was neither fair nor concerned. So the practical answers to my questions were crystal clear. But on a broader level, on a meaning of life level, I could find no satisfactory answer. Religion was empty. The thought of a great despot in the sky to whom I owed my soul was no solace. And besides, I saw no shred of evidence that God was the truth. Christianity, the trendy religion of the time and place, was just a mythological construct designed to control people, much like every other religion that had existed throughout history. At the age of 14, I had already dismissed the notion of God. His existence was neither practical as a reality nor desirable as a fantasy. My belief in God had the same shelf life as my belief in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, two entities that, unlike God, at least had something concrete to offer, presence and money. What did God offer? A place in the clouds where you could go kiss his ass for eternity? No thanks. A sense of civic duty was foreign to me and remains so to this day. I have occasionally raised money for charities, including the Water Project, a charity that builds wells for people in Africa, and the International Women's Health Coalition, a feminist group that helps girls in third world shitholes where feminism is actually needed. I have a low opinion of feminism in the West, but in nations where women are still consigned to the role of second-class citizens, I consider myself a staunch feminist, though I'm still fond of a well-constructed sexist joke, or even a poorly constructed one if I'm being drunk or honest. I must be emphatic here, however, although I can occasionally give myself over to a greater cause for a brief window of time, I could never sustain such an effort in the long term, my hatred of the human race will always nag me into seeing the endeavor to change the world as a waste of my time, and I am therefore unable to engage my passions to that end with any degree of sustainability. My misanthropy is too all-encompassing for me to feel inclined to devote myself to a life of service to the greater good. At the age of 33, my misanthropy has only grown more powerful. Often I find it painful to exist with this seething contempt for my own species broiling and churning within me, but I have found no effective remedy for this condition. I have instead found ample causes to exacerbate it despite the suffocating grief I incur as a result. Hatred of humanity is rarely a satisfying hatred. It's a bleak, depressing, disappointed hatred that often is just a stopgap for the tears I want to shed for my fellow man and for myself. So when I was faced with the inevitable existential dilemma that all thinking people face, my 14-year-old self could not retreat into religion and slap the God band-aid across my psychological wounds, nor could I transform myself into a do-gooding crusader who seeks fulfillment in making the world a better place. I could not find faith in a cosmic despot that defied reason, nor could I see why such a horrible species as humanity deserved a better world in which to live. So what of science? What of intellectual pursuits? I knew early on that I could never be a scientist. Although I have tremendous respect for what scientists do, my mind doesn't work like theirs. A scientist sees things in absolutes, and they're diligent in their search to uncover new facts about the world. They are meticulous people, patient, and willing to devote mountains of time to exploring every facet of a new problem. In contrast, I see things in shades of gray. I give up easily when something is difficult, and I find the meticulous attention to detail that a good scientist must possess to be a tedious and frustrating burden. I am interested in the results and conclusions of science, but the process of doing science would absolutely bore me. Engineering and mathematics would carry with them similar problems. I have a great affinity for intellectuals, a small affinity for activists, and almost no affinity for the religious. But ultimately, they all seek the same thing. They seek out the truth, that which Friedrich Nietzsche described thusly. What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms in short, a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm, canonical, and obligatory to a people. Truths are an illusion about which one has forgotten that is what they are. 
metaphors which have worn out and without sensuous power, coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. We still do not know where the urge for truth comes from, for as yet we have heard only of the obligation imposed by society that it should exist. To be truthful means using the customary metaphors. In moral terms, the obligation to lie according to fixed convention, to lie herd-like in a style obligatory for all. Friedrich Nietzsche, on truth and lie in an extra moral sense, the Viking portable Nietzsche, translated by Walter Kaufman. What Nietzsche is saying there, when boiled down to its simplest terms, is that truth is a social construct, that our conceptions of truth are little more than traditions that have been puffed up with rhetoric and metaphor to give them an artificial weight and gravity. I have more than once bored my audience to death by reading to them from a poem by Stephen Crane. It goes like so. Truth, said a traveler, is a rock a mighty fortress. Often have I been to it, even to its highest tower, from whence the world looks black. Truth, said a traveler, is a breath, a wind, a shadow, a phantom. Long have I pursued it, but never have I touched the hem of its garment. And I believed the second traveler, for truth was to me a breath, a wind a shadow, a phantom, and never had I touched the hem of its garment. Stephen Crane, The Black Riders and Other Lines, 1895. We live now in an age of three basic competing truths. The truth of God, religion, the truth of good, morality, and the truth of science. There may be disagreement, as to who God is and what good is, and even some argument over what science is empirically valid, but almost all overarching truths, the big truths that people cling to, fall neatly into these three categories. You can even see science and religion fighting about which of them dictates morality, with religion claiming that scientific morality cannot be objective and is therefore useless, while science claims that religious morality is regressive and based on unfounded myths. People, regardless of where they derive their truths from, are determined that truth is a rock, never merely a breath. A subjective world where there is no mighty fortress of truth to plant your feet is disconcerting. Well, then allow me the honor of being the decomposer of this disconcerto. God isn't the truth. He is a fictional construct of man, as evidenced by the mountains of discarded gods that overflow the garbage bin of history. It is further evidenced by the contradictory nature of an all-powerful and all-knowing and all-wise being who creates faulty humans and then blames them for their imperfections. It is further evidenced by the fact that much of what was once attributed to God, we now have naturalistic explanations for that are far more satisfactory and for which there is much greater evidence. I could write a book on all the reasons why I don't believe in God, but several authors like Richard Dawkins, Victor J. Stenger, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and others have already done so, and their books are more than sufficient reading on that particular topic. Science, though it is to be respected, is not the truth. Science creates predictive models of reality that are deemed useful if their predictive powers are demonstrable. Newtonian physics are the truth in that we can use them to understand the properties of reality, but with the discovery of the quantum world, quantum physics began to develop as a new and more precise predictive model. We still use Newtonian physics in most instances because it's precise enough to be useful and quantum physics still has a way to go. There's not even a quantum theory of gravity yet. But a model that explains why you like chocolate ice cream is not the same thing as chocolate ice cream or your experience of it. 
Perhaps science will one day ascend to the level of truth, but for now it is merely a methodology whereby we can have a greater understanding of the world through a system that is minimally dependent on human bias. But here's the big one. Here's the one that religion and science both fight over, like two dogs pulling at different ends of the same toy, each hoping to jerk it away from the other. Here's where things get messy and people get upset. Good isn't the truth. Morality isn't the truth. It is a pliable system of behavioral controls designed to subdue behavioral traits that are, for the moment, considered unfashionable. Morality is every bit as subject to the temperamental whims of humanity as fashion or diet or decor or slang or any other human frivolity. Homosexuality just in my lifetime, went from being perceived largely as an immoral and unnatural act to being perceived largely as a perfectly moral act that is worthy of respect and is even treated heroically in some circles. Histories and cultures have flip-flopped on this issue throughout time. Many Native American tribes were totally accepting of homosexuality and even transgenderism. In ancient Greece, many considered relations between men and adolescent boys to be a good learning experience for the boys and a means of population control. Plato, widely considered the pillar of Western philosophy, praised such relationships in his early works, though he would later disavow this stance. Today, Plato would be booed off the national stage in utter disgust if he were to utter such a position. I mean, Kevin Spacey might have his back, but that's about it. In ancient Egypt, even worshipped deities such as Horus engaged in homosexual acts. There exist to this day depictions of Horus f***ing men in the ass. Imagine walking into a Christian church and seeing Jesus pounding some man butt. It would be a completely surreal experience. But ancient Egyptians didn't blink at the equivalent. Of course, Egyptian culture at the time was pretty freaky, They condoned incest and even considered some prostitutes sacred. They weren't the only ancient society to embrace that concept either. Today, being gay in Egypt can result in a three-year prison sentence. And in 2013, 95% of Egyptians polled believed homosexuality should not be accepted by society. Usually, I'm not a traditionalist, but I think Egypt needs to get back to its freaky roots. Whether homosexuality is good or bad depends on where you are, when you are, and what sort of homosexuality you practice. In ancient Rome, to penetrate a man was looked at with respect, but to be penetrated by a man was looked at with scorn. In Japan, men of equal social standing hooking up would have been viewed negatively, but a powerful man from a higher caste taking on a a younger lover from a lower caste was seen as completely normal and a net positive for both men. Humanity's ever-changing attitudes towards homosexuality are far from the only example of our wildly shifting and changing morality. For example, uh, simply look at the Bible, where a man described as righteous and good offers up his virgin daughters to a rape mob rather than let his house guests, who were complete strangers, be raped by aforesaid mob. The name of this supposedly righteous man was Lot, and today few people would describe his actions as moral. But at the time the Bible was written, he was considered the good guy. He was so good, in fact, that when God chose to smite the city where Lot lived, it was only Lot and his family that God spared. No person of modern moral sensibilities would ever view offering one's daughters up to be gang-raped by an angry mob as morally good. John McClane never did anything like that, nor did Luke Skywalker or Tony Stark. We tend to like our heroes a little more reluctant to offer up their kids to be raped these days. But perhaps our friend Sam Harris can help us. He's a famous atheist and neuroscientist who wrote a book called The Moral Landscape, which purports right on its dust jacket to tell us how science can determine human values. 
Maybe he has the answer to what Lot should have done when an angry mob showed up at his house demanding to rape his newly arrived house guests. Well, according to Harris, moral good can be defined as that which increases the well-being of conscious creatures. And he is utilitarian in that he believes that the greatest good is that which increases the well-being of the most conscious creatures. So then, would Harris simply recommend giving the rape mob what they want? It is the solution that brings about the most happiness, is it not? Lot and his family won't like seeing their guests raped, and I'm sure the guest won't enjoy it much, but the vast majority of people, everyone in town, according to the Bible, will be most happy if they are simply allowed to rape. Hmm, that doesn't really sound right, does it? Harris makes some attempt to address these sorts of problems in the moral landscape, but the attempt is rather pitiful. He writes... We already know that psychopaths have brain damage that prevents them from having certain deeply satisfying experiences like empathy uh, that seem good for people both personally and collectively in that they tend to increase well-being on both counts. Psychopaths, therefore, don't know what they are missing, but we do. Psychopaths are generally ruled by compulsions that they don't understand and cannot resist. It is absolutely clear that whatever they might believe about what they are doing, psychopaths are seeking some form of well-being, excitement, ecstasy, feelings of power, etc. But because of their neurological and social deficits, they are doing a very bad job of it. We can say that a psychopath like Ted Bundy takes satisfaction in the wrong things because living a life purposed towards raping and killing women does not allow for deeper and more generalizable forms of human flourishing. Is there any doubt that Ted Bundy's yes, I love this detectors were poorly coupled to the possibilities of finding deep fulfillment in his life or that his obsession with raping and killing young women was a poor guide to the proper goals of morality, i.e. living a fulfilling life with others? His solution to the problem of sadism is to simply say that, well... Bad people are obviously defective, so their sense of their own well-being is warped. Therefore, what? We can just ignore them in the moral equation? That's like saying, I have discovered an objective measure of what tastes best. Whichever flavor brings the most people the most happiness is the best flavor, and it turns out, we've researched it, it turns out that peanut butter is the flavor that brings people the most happiness, so we must all eat peanut butter. Oh, what's that you say? Some people are allergic to peanut butter? Well, they're just defects of nature, so ignore them. Don't let them ruin the objectively good taste of peanut butter. It's science! Not to mention the fact that under Harris's view of morality, the strongest condemnation he can muster for a psychopathic serial killer like Ted Bundy is that he's doing a bad job at finding his own well-being. Pretty mild admonition, don't you think? However, Harris in the preceding excerpt was only addressing the psychopathy of one man. The story of Lot, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, concerns an entire city of rape-hungry fiends who are simply starving for some non-consensual fun. They obviously all feel that it's in their best interest to rape the weary travelers taking shelter at Lot's house. So if we apply the Harris standard here, then I must ask, if every man and most of the women in town are going to be the happiest raping a group of wayward travelers, then who is Sam Harris to deprive them of that sublime act of well-being-seeking? The people have spoken, and they want rape. Now, my objections to Harris's moral philosophy are withered a bit if you pan back and realize that Harris would simply take an even broader look at the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah and come to the conclusion, probably rightly, 
that a society where rape is tolerated as the norm is ultimately bound to create more suffering than happiness, or at least more suffering than is necessary. A society where no one rapes or wants to rape is clearly going to cause less suffering than a society where rape is as normal as brushing your teeth. This broader view is the basis through which Harris opposes moral relativism. He's less focused on individual decisions and situations and more focused on the collective of humanity, as he makes clear in his 2010 TED Talk, Can Science Answer Moral Questions? Here's an excerpt of Sam Harris speaking on the subject of Islam and more broadly on the subject of moral relativism. Now this brings us to the sorts of moves that people are apt to make in the moral sphere, okay? Consider the great problem of women's bodies. What to do about them? Well, this is one thing you can do about them. You can cover them up. Now, it is the position, generally speaking, of our intellectual community that, well, we might not like this. We might think of this as wrong in Boston or Palo Alto. Who are we to say that the proud denizens of an ancient culture are wrong to force their wives and daughters to live in cloth bags? I mean, who are we to say even that they're wrong to beat them with lengths of steel cable or throw battery acid in their faces if they decline the privilege of being smothered in this way? Okay, well, who are we not to say this? Who are we to pretend that we know so little about human well-being that we have to be non-judgmental about a practice like this? I'm not talking about voluntary wearing of a veil. I mean, women should be able to wear whatever they want, as far as I'm concerned. But what does voluntary mean in a community where when a girl gets raped, her father's first impulse, rather often, is to murder her out of shame? Just let that fact detonate in your brain for a minute. Your daughter gets raped, and what you want to do is kill her. What, what are the chances that represents a peak of human flourishing? This line of reasoning strikes me as a specious appeal to emotion that presupposes the superiority of Western moral precepts with no legitimate basis for doing so. The West once believed that slavery was a morally righteous institution, so much so that hundreds of thousands of men died fighting for its preservation when a disagreement erupted over the issue. To simply presuppose our own moral superiority to other cultures is to negate and avoid examination of ourselves. Just as we in the present look at the barbarity of the past and cringe at the wickedness of our ancestors, so too will future generations look back at us with the same disgust. Perhaps it will be our treatment of animals that they find hideously immoral, or our treatment of the environment. Or perhaps it will be something we cannot even imagine. Perhaps in the future it will be considered a great moral evil to sleep on a bed and us bed-sleeping fools of the past will be looked upon as disgustingly indulgent hedonists obsessed to an unhealthy degree with our own comfort. If you don't think morality can be so arbitrary, then open your Bibles once again and read about Moses condemning a man to death for working on the wrong day, or God telling his people that to mix fabrics is a horrible sin. Or, if you want a more contemporary example of arbitrary morality, then look no further than our society's condemnation of prostitution. As is often the case, George Carlin said it best, selling is legal, f***ing is legal, why isn't selling f***ing legal? And to those who point to the dangers of prostitution as evidence for why it should be illegal, I will remind them of the patently obvious fact that it would be a lot less dangerous if it weren't an unregulated black market. Hell, only 17% of Americans think polygamy should be legal. But what possible objection could exist to adults making a choice about their own sexuality and with whom they shall cohabitate? Polygamy is a practice that President James Garfield once described as an offense to moral sense. 
And most people still agree, despite the fact that the very Bible that James Garfield was sworn in on is riddled with polygamy, and never once is it condemned. King Solomon, considered the wisest ruler of the Bible, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He doesn't sound wise to me. That's a lot of nagging to deal with. (laughs) See, I told you I could appreciate a good sexist joke. Opposition to moral relativism seems to me to take only one form, whether it's being attacked from the left or from the right, and it's the weakest argument I've ever heard. It goes like this. But if we accept moral relativism, then we can't pronounce moral judgments on other cultures, and we really like doing that. Where's the logic in that? I can't find it, and I've looked. We're so eager to say, especially of the Muslim world, Uh, They keep their women in bags and they beat them when they get out of line. That's clearly wrong. Yet, where is our great outrage at the fact that our stores are filled with chocolate derived from cocoa beans harvested with child labor and even child slavery in Western Africa? We don't mind supporting their f***ed up culture to the point of participating in it monetarily. I'm pretty sure that the child slaves who work under terrible, dangerous conditions so that the $60 billion a year chocolate industry can feed your fat ass Milky Ways and M&Ms are suffering just as much as the Muslim women who are forced to wear niqabs, maybe even more so. When's the last time you even heard someone talk about our culpability in that? The story is the same for the diamond industry. And much of our cheap clothing and electronics are manufactured in third world sweatshops where people are paid pennies for an hour. Hell, in the United States, we're technically allies with Saudi Arabia, one of the strictest Muslim territories on the face of the earth. We're happy to condemn their way of life, but we don't allow our condemnation to hinder our continued monetary support, do we? Even Western workers often contend with brutal work conditions, as evidenced by the recent expose of Amazon's warehouses, where workers are reportedly peeing in bottles because they can't even find the time in their overworked schedule to go to the bathroom. In the UK, 55% of workers stated that their job has given them depression, and over 80% said they would not apply for an Amazon job again. Recently, Amazon fired 100 workers in Spain for striking for better work conditions. James Bloodworth, a former Amazon employee from the UK, said this of the conditions. My first week there, two people collapsed from dehydration. It's so commonplace to see someone collapse that nobody is even shocked anymore. You'll just hear a manager complain that he has to do some report now, while a couple of new people try to help the guy. Veterans won't risk helping because it drips rate. No sitting allowed, and there's nowhere to sit anywhere except the break rooms. Before the robots, they call them kivas, uh, pickers would regularly walk 10 to 15 miles a day. Now it's just stand for 10 to 12 hours a day. People complain about the heat all the time, but we just get told 80 degrees Fahrenheit, obviously, is a safe working temperature. Sometimes they'll even pull out a thermometer, but even when it hits 85, they just say it's fine. There's been deaths, at least one in my building. Amazon likes to keep it all hush-hush. Heard about others, you can find the stories if you search for it, but Amazon does a good job burying it. The reality is that Western civilization is often at the forefront of championing cruelty for profit. This capitalistic brutality manifests itself in a plethora of ways. Uh, The brutality we allow our corporations to engage in at home and abroad, as described above. The the horrors of the private prison industry in the USA, uh, an institution that gives companies a financial incentive to imprison people. And these same companies then, of course, use some of their money to lobby for stricter sentencing guidelines and more criminalization, 
We have created a profit motive for putting people in prison. We call ourselves the land of the free, but in reality, we in the United States have the highest per capita prison rate of any nation on earth other than Seychelles. How about the horrors of the military industrial complex, an entire industry built around war, devouring tax dollars and shitting out weapons and other military machinery. We used to look down at people who made money off of war, calling them war profiteers. Now it's seen as a legitimate business model. But don't worry, I'm sure that the multi-billion dollar U.S. arms industry that made $209.7 billion worth of sales in 2015 alone isn't at all a factor in the United States being perpetually at war. We bombed seven different countries in 2016 alone. Now, let me make something clear. I am not an anti-capitalist. I like money. I plan to sell this book for money, and you'll never see me wearing a Che Guevara shirt or sporting the hammer and sickle of the former Soviet Union as a fashion statement. But let's be honest about the downsides of embracing capitalism as completely as America has done. Let's be honest about the immoral deeds done openly in this country and, to a lesser extent, throughout the West in the name of profit. My friend and respected YouTube colleague Kyle Kalinske of the popular YouTube politics show Secular Talk has put forth similar ideas to Sam Harris concerning morality, condemning the moral relativism of postmodernist thought, and he's told me in private conversations that he eagerly awaits the portion of my book where I talk about moral relativism, and at this juncture we've reached it. So for Kyle and for Sam Harris and for everyone else who holds to the notion that moral relativism is a preposterous thing, here's my thoughts in their very simplest form. You're wrong. Now here's my thoughts in a much less simple form. Moral relativism is not only an observable reality from culture to culture, but from subculture to subculture, from time period to time period, and from person to person. Morality is absolutely relative. In fact, the term moral relativism isn't even all-encompassing enough to describe the nature of my stance on morality. I prefer to think of myself as championing a form of moral nihilism which is defined as the meta-ethical view that nothing is morally right or wrong. Now, before you go leaping to the defense of morality or weeping at its demise, let's take our eye off the distracting illusion of what morality purports to be and instead look at the black and vicious heart of what morality actually is. And for that, let's revisit my 14-year-old self, who is still in the midst of the first of his many existential crises. Where did I turn for meaning? When faced with the lack of purpose inherent to human existence, what path of purpose did I try to walk? God was ludicrous, civics was for do-gooders, and science was tedious. So I found my refuge in art. I could find no truth in art, but I was obsessed with the beauty of its lies. The world was full of shit in all the wrong ways, but in art I could find whatever line of bullshit most satisfied me, and unlike religion, it didn't require the gullibility to actually fall for it, only the ability to entertain it and to be entertained by it. For the darkness in me, there was Lovecraft. For the rebel, Marilyn Manson. For the optimist, Star Trek. For the adventurer, Star Wars. For the cynic, Carlin. For the dreamer, Dali. For every facet of my soul, there was some musician, performer, author, director, comedian, or painter who could feed it, who could teach it, who could guide it. I wanted more than anything to be an artist of one kind or another. I wanted to take what was inside of me and show it to other people in a way that might resonate with them, in a way that might create a beautiful alchemical reaction in their being, changing them in ways both subtle and fundamental. Nothing seemed more important to me than this ambition— I would be a great director of superlative films, the likes of which the world had never seen. I would be a musician and singer with lyrics that would change the world. I would be a writer whose words would ring out through history as a beacon of my own importance, signaling my genius to all generations. (laughs) 
the megalomania I possess today is a pale imitation of the unbridled ego of my youth. I was starving to be important, recognized, beloved, and celebrated. And it was this aspiration that imbued me with purpose. There could be no objective meaning to my life, but I could settle for what I imagined was the next best thing. The intersubjective consensus of my peers that I was greater than other men, that I was smarter, deeper, and infinitely more brilliant and wise. Humility was not among my strengths. I didn't see myself as I was. I didn't see a fat, zit-faced, socially awkward, introverted teenager. All I could see was my own grandiose vision of how great I would be someday. I never suspected for even a second that I would one day be 33 years old, still fat, still awkward, still introverted, but at least no longer zit-faced. Instead of directing sweeping epic films watched by millions, I make YouTube videos watched by thousands. Instead of being beloved for my genius, I am often hated for my obnoxious bluntness. Instead of writing world-shattering novels, I write YouTube videos and this meandering screed of a book. Yet, yet, if I had never aimed for genius director... I might not have even made it to mid-level YouTuber. If I'd been more practical, I might now be a gas station clerk. If I hadn't aspired to be a great novelist, I might never have mastered writing well enough to convey these thoughts to you now. If I never tried to be the equal of my heroes like George Carlin and Marilyn Manson, I might never have developed enough showmanship to engage with anyone on an interesting level. And so art for me was never a grand truth. I never thought it was, but it was a personal truth. And it was a personal truth that shaped my life in ways that I think were ultimately for the better. Art never gave me a rigid series of rules and said, do these things and you will achieve greatness. It gave me tools, it gave me guidelines, and most importantly, it gave me ambition. I may not be everything I wanted to be, or even close, but the benefit of hindsight shows me that I'm much more than I could have been. Salvador Dali once said, at the age of six, I wanted to be a cook. At seven, I wanted to be Napoleon, and my ambition has been growing steadily ever since. Dali was an accomplished artist, But he fell well short of his greatest ambitions, but it didn't ultimately matter because his ambitions were so great that even in falling short of them, he achieved greatness. I think that you must treat morality the way that an aspiring young artist treats art. You must conceive of yourself as the ultimate moral being and strive towards that goal so that even if you fall terribly short of it, you have still managed to be less rotten than you might have been. But in order to do that, you must realize that morality at its best is deeply personal and completely subjective. When I was young and attending school, I had within me a pathological aversion to authority. And being prone to deconstruction, I was always astutely observing the systems whereby my peers and I were controlled. I noticed that oftentimes rules were completely arbitrary nonsense with with seemingly no good reason for being. For instance, my school had a policy of no hats, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why such a rule existed. What was the dire consequence of allowing students to wear hats? I asked about it and I was told that hats would be too great a distraction. I felt perplexed and incensed by that answer. If hats were introduced into the student population, they would become such a distraction that productivity would cease. I was going to do the assignment, Mr. Jenkins, but the kid in front of me was wearing a hat, and I just couldn't take my eyes off it. Goddamn hat was mesmerizing. (laughs) Occasionally, though, some of the more rebellious kids would sneak in a hat, you know? 
They would wear it when teachers weren't watching, or they'd even brazenly wear it in class and have to be told to remove it. It was after observing this several times that I hypothesized why such a rule actually existed. Teenagers are prone to acts of rebellion, so it made sense for the adults to give them some meaningless and arbitrary rules so that their inevitable transgressions against said rules would result not in any sort of tangible disruption, but instead in a prosaic act of of mere pseudo-rebellion. In other words, rules like no hats only exist to channel youthful rebellion into benign defiance rather than a substantive defiance of the actual system of authoritarian control being implemented. It was the system's way of giving us a symbolic issue to fight over so that the substance of their dominion was less likely to be jeopardized by kids going, uh, you know, kids not going along with the program. I was distressed when I realized that the adult world functions in pretty much the same way. If the population is dissatisfied with the condition of society, then the leaders will invariably find a symbolic issue to channel the people's focus away from any action that threatens the powerful. Oh, you're poor? Well, that's a real shame. Well, look at that rich NFL player who won't kneel for the national anthem. Doesn't that disgust you? Aren't you pissed off about that? Pay no attention to the system that keeps you in poverty, even though you work 40 hours a week and so does your spouse. Instead, focus on Colin Kaepernick not respecting our national theme song and refusing to grovel before our national rag. Don't be disobedient in your own interest. Instead, turn on someone being disobedient in his own interest, because that's the American way. Make no mistake. For the people upset at Colin Kaepernick and the other NFL players taking a knee during the national anthem, that fight is a moral issue. They're genuinely incensed that someone doesn't show proper respect for the very same country that's fucking them over, especially when it's someone who has it better than them. What does he have to complain about? He makes $20 million a year. I'm stuck in a shitty job. Fuck him. <laughs> no. Fuck the corporation who doesn't compensate you fairly for your shitty job, the country that lets them get away with it, and most of all, you for being so easily distracted by symbols and pageantry that you don't stop to take a look at who your real enemies are. So, have you figured out yet what, what the morality foisted upon you by society actually is? Have you figured out yet that morality is not about bad or good, but is about the controllers and the controlled? If not, let me beat you over the head with yet another example. Who are the most despised people in all of society? Child rapists. Even among murderers and thieves and regular old garden variety rapists, a child rapist is the lowest form of human scum. So let's think about the Catholic Church for a moment. It is well known by now that for years the Catholic Church was home to priests who used their positions of power to rape children. When this great, supposedly ultra-moral organization uncovered the activities of these men, the power structure of the Catholic Church did not bring them to justice. It did not even kick them out of the church. It covered up their activities. And if a priest received a bad reputation for raping kids in one diocese, they simply moved them to another so they could start anew. The great moral entity called church who had stood in judgment of millions of supposed sinners throughout its storied history, when faced with its own evil, did the worst thing possible. It camouflaged that evil. It protected that evil. It knowingly and willfully provided shelter and a victim pool to its most sexually predacious priests. Let's think about this for a second. In prison, a child rapist is looked at as complete scum even by murderers. Often they are beaten and even killed by their fellow inmates in prison. In civil society, they're looked at with the utmost disgust, and if allowed back into the world after serving in prison, they are closely monitored like no other criminal. 
society considers few, if any, actions more reprehensible. So how can it be that the entire power structure of the Catholic Church, a church with 1.2 billion members, saw this problem of rampant child sexual abuse in its midst and said, the best way to handle this is to cover it up and to protect our predators? How does that make sense? In all actuality, it makes perfect sense when you come to the realization that morality as it exists now is nothing more than a tool of the powerful to control the powerless. The 1.2 billion members of the church are expected to conduct themselves according to the morals foisted upon them by said church, but those in the church's power structure do not hold themselves to the same standards. They don't view themselves as beholden to the same morality as their parishioners because they know what those parishioners don't, that the morality that they peddle is not about good or bad. It's about maintaining power and control. So even the clergy that weren't sexually preying on kids were defending those who did and working hard to see that predator priests were spared from the negative consequences of their insidious transgressions. The mantra of the powerful has always been we are the powerful and we can do as we please you are the subjects and you will do as you're told morality has always been about do as i say not as i do that's why sam harris rails against islamic evil but turns a blind eye to the evils of his own society that's why the government of the united states can act disgusted when some two-bit dictator murders innocent people but is completely comfortable with their own complicity in murdering the innocent when it suits their their national interests That's why the Catholic Church can make the unconscionable decision to protect the worst sorts of predators in its midst. That's why a burglar who steals $200 will see the inside of a prison cell, but a banker who steals $200 million will continue to sip cocktails in a posh spa in Aruba while perfect 10 women pretend to enjoy sucking his underwhelming dick. Morality is a mechanism of control. Nietzsche recognized this 130 years ago, and I know we're not as smart as Nietzsche, but I think it's time we caught up with him on this simple point. It's not difficult to grasp, and once you see it at all, you'll see it everywhere. Aside from being a mechanism of control, morality is also a human construct that is completely subjective. And since there are many who believe in some form of objective morality based either in science or religion, I will need to defend my statement that morality is subjective. Though in honesty, I just as soon uh, not waste my breath or the energy required to animate my fingers But because I love you, I'll slum it by actually entertaining objective morality for a moment. If we look at humankind from a far enough distance to escape our anthropocentrism, we see that the universe itself cares about nothing. Nature cares about nothing. It is completely cold to us and to everything else within it. Nature has no special affinity for us or for any other living thing. The vast majority of species that have ever existed on Earth are now extinct. Nature didn't see fit to save them. Nature saw fit to kill them. Nature has created a a system whereby animals feed on one another to one another to to survive if a gazelle must die for a lion to eat nature is fine with that system nature has created a system where many birds produce more offspring than they can feed just so they have a backup kid the smaller and weaker baby birds are often pecked to death or kicked out of the nest to starve when they become too burdensome So think about that, a living thing brought into this world just to die, a living thing that only exists on the off chance that something goes wrong with his or her siblings. And if nothing goes wrong, they die, having never been given a chance to live. Is that the design of a compassionate mother nature who loves us and has some great moral plan in mind for us? At any moment, a giant asteroid could collide with the Earth and wipe out all or most of the life on this planet. It's happened before. There's no magical force preventing it from happening again. Nature shows us 
no deference because nature has no awareness and no compassion. Christians try to give nature compassion by calling it God. It's not just them. Other religions do it too. Instead of a cold mother, they say we have a warm father who loves us all very much. So why do we suffer? Because he's testing us. Because we must prove ourselves worthy in this life to attain eternal paradise in an afterlife that begins when we die and shed our mortal bodies. There's no evidence whatsoever that this idea is true, so it's little more than pretty wrapping paper around a turd. A more scientific explanation for how nature has given us morality can be furnished through evolutionary biology. Even Darwin himself believed that morality was a byproduct of evolution. Humans have evolved a capacity for cooperation unprecedented among mammals. I think bacterial colonies that can function as a single organism might have us beat, but whatever. Uh, researcher Michael Tomasello, co-director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, has observed that it is inconceivable that you would ever see two chimpanzees carrying a log together. Uh, the reason why is there's no mechanism within chimpanzees that allows them to cooperate on that level. For us, cooperation is a natural trait that manifests in early childhood. The idea behind the evolution of morality is that from evolution, we have developed a natural inclination to cooperate, uh, an ability to empathize with one another, a sense of fairness, and an ability to recognize shared intentionality. And from these things spring our concept of morality. So let's reiterate these traits that scientists have proposed as the building blocks of morality. One, cooperation. Two, empathy. Three, a concept of fairness. And four, a recognition of shared intentionality. It makes us sound so noble, doesn't it? Let me give you a scenario. <laughs> Two cavemen are sitting around a fire. And they're watching their neighbor in the cave nearby. And he has all sorts of shiny rocks and all the best cave women. Then one caveman says to the other, Thag has all the shiny rocks and all the best women. That's not fair. They're very articulate cavemen. And his friend says, I empathize with your feelings about Thag. Hey, I have an idea. Let's cooperate and kill Thag. And with wondrous shared intentionality, they do just that. They bash Thag's brains in with a big rock and steal his gems and his buxom cave ladies. Sounding a little less noble now, yeah? Ultimately... I have no objection to the idea that evolution has played a hand in the development of modern conceptions of morality as it has had a hand in all human behavior, compassionate or brutal. My question is, whence cometh the objectivity? Just because morality evolved with man doesn't mean that morality is objective, and just because some constituent pieces of human nature like fairness and empathy can be building blocks of morality doesn't mean they can't also be building blocks of immorality as well. All right, so let's boil everything we've talked about so far down to three basic premises, shall we? I would hate for you to lose the plot. Here's what's going on in this verbose tangent. One, Morality is primarily used as a mechanism of control by the powerful to keep their subjects in line. Two, morality is completely subjective. And three, for morality to be useful to us moving forward, we must reject it as a mechanism of control and embrace its subjectivity. We must embrace a more personalized take on morality that enables us to embody our own unique visions of morality the same way that an artist develops their own style of art. I will speak no further on premises one and two, but premise three, no doubt, has raised questions in your mind. Well, let's be honest. There's one big lingering question in your mind above all others. 
If we were to embrace this idea of highly personalized morality, are we not opening the floodgates for some really fucked up notions of moral good? Are we not giving every would-be Hitler the power to label themselves good without us being able to argue against it in any concrete way? Well, if we are to treat morality as art, then we must treat ourselves as the artist of morality, and we must therefore look to art for the answer to the question. Uh, some people are really bad at art, just as some people are really bad at morality. Usually the bad art is rejected and never goes anywhere, but occasionally art that is considered bad by many discerning people reaches extraordinary heights. A painter slams their paint-covered butt against a canvas, calls it untitled, charges $1.3 million for it, and some scum businessman who needs to launder some money buys the painting. Or a hack director like Michael Bay, uh, who makes the same overwrought brainless action film for the 17th time, is rewarded by a stampede of fools rushing to the cinema desperate to be parted for their money. Usually, bad art fails, but occasionally it succeeds. The same would be true of morality. In a world where morality is strictly personal, people will share their moral ideas and moral philosophies, and usually the bad ones will be defeated and die off, but occasionally, because we're a stupid species, bad ideas will take flight and become the latest trend, and the Michael Bays of morality will convince people that the latest moral trend is shitting on the sidewalk to keep our sewers clean. This is where law comes in. Law needs to be separate from morality, but we'll get into law in a later chapter. The main thing that you need to understand up front is something that Marilyn Manson expressed in his 1999 essay for Rolling Stone, Columbine, Whose Fault Is It? He said, we live in a free country, but with that freedom, there is a burden of personal responsibility. Rather than teaching a child what is moral and immoral, right and wrong, we first and foremost can establish what the laws that govern us are. You can always escape hell by not believing in it, but you cannot escape death and you cannot escape prison. Well, you actually can escape prison either by getting away with your crimes or by actually physically breaking out of the prison, but the point remains. Whatever moral notions people develop, uh, that can only be allowed to govern their behavior up to a point. We as a society still need collective order, and for that we need tangible consequences to the actions that we deem not necessarily wrong, but simply and pragmatically not conducive to a functional and prosperous society. So if some raging psychopath wants to say, in my moral system, chopping people's heads off is okay, Society's response to that is, you're free to believe that, and maybe you're right, but if you act on those values, you're going into a cage forever, and you're going to be really f sad. And if, by some miracle of human stupidity, that guy's morality becomes popular enough that the laws of the land are changed and chopping off people's heads is now legal, well, then at that point, don't we deserve the disastrous results? In the words of the Internet's restless hive mind, Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. So here are this chapter's aphorisms. Number one, if a person offers you rules, what they are actually offering is chains. What they call good is that which suits and empowers them. What they call bad is that which offends and challenges them. Number two, you must be the artist of your own morality. Morality must evolve with the needs of the age, and it cannot evolve as quickly as it must if good and bad are a matter of deference to tradition. And number three, you can escape another's moral judgments simply by not giving weight to them, but you cannot escape the consequences of the law simply by ignoring it. Whoa, I think I just figured something out, Beavis. <laughs> what? <laughs> this <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, really. <laughs> me. This more than anything that has ever sucked before. The Order of Chaos, Chapter Three: 
why everything sucks. I was sitting in the living room with my fiance Chelsea watching the news on YouTube. She passed me the joint we were smoking together and said, why does existence have to suck so much? And maybe it was just the copious excess of THC rattling around in my brain, or maybe it was the fact that I never emotionally matured beyond the age of 15, but for whatever reason, her question struck me as the most profound philosophical investigation I'd ever been invited to undertake. Most of the supposedly profound questions that philosophers and self-styled deep thinkers like to toss around really don't pack much of a punch, do they? Why are we here? No reason. What's the meaning of life? There isn't one. Is there a God? No. Free will or determinism? Who cares? But my beautiful and wise fiance, Chelsea Stanton, the most effortlessly rebellious person I've ever met, finally posed to me a question that I didn't readily have the answer to and couldn't easily dismiss as irrelevant. Why does everything have to suck so much? I mean, leaders suck, TV shows suck, movies suck, school sucks, work sucks, pets suck, cars suck, etc. Every facet of life sucks in some way, according to someone. Even something everybody loves, like ice cream, can suck. You can get an ice cream headache. It's full of sugar and calories that make you fat. The milk used to make it is exploitative to cows. If you eat too much of it, which is easy to do, you can get a stomach ache. Uh, you can't always have it when you want it because you're on a diet or because you have a toothache and the cold ice cream will make it worse. Some people are lactose intolerant and can't have it at all unless they eat a special lactose-free version that I presume tastes like garbage. Some things really, really, really suck on a whole other level, like losing a loved one or having a severe illness or being horribly disfigured in an accident or getting raped or being trapped in poverty or being at war or being homeless or being addicted to drugs or going to prison or suffering the mental and physical decline associated with aging or falling out with a family member or formerly close friend or a thousand and one other tragedies that are known to kick the human psyche in the teeth with alarming regularity. From stubbing your toe to genocide, from a mosquito bite to a nuclear war, from being bored in class to being ripped apart by wolves while your family watches in stunned terror, from the insignificant trifling annoyances to the monumental life-shattering tragedies, the evidence is ample that existence is indeed jam-packed with suck. Despite this fact, whenever I've publicly expressed the idea that life sucks, I am invariably accosted by starry-eyed optimists, read miserable fucks in denial, who want to let me know that life doesn't suck. Why? I, I tune them out for the most part, but it usually boils down to, because mountains are pretty and puppy dogs have waggly tails. The problem, they suggest, is not that life sucks. The problem is that my attitude sucks. This propensity for optimism and for finding the silver lining of even the darkest storm clouds has certainly served its purpose in human society. For example, I recently read the account of a Jewish woman at a concentration camp, uh, Auschwitz, uh, where she used humor to keep her spirits up during a terrible time. When they cut our hair at Auschwitz, that was something terrible. After they cut my hair off, suddenly I saw some girlfriends of mine that I've known for a very long time. Many cried. They cried after long hair, and then I started laughing. And they asked, what, are you out of your mind? What are you laughing about? I said, this I never had before, a hairdo for free, never in my whole life. And I still remember, they looked at me as if I was crazy. This brave woman was not the only Jew during the Holocaust to use humor to diffuse the darkness of the times. There were many plays written and performed by Jews in the 1,000-plus Jewish ghettos like Warsaw during the time of Jewish persecution by the Nazis. You would imagine that people who had been torn from their place in society and isolated in subhuman conditions would create very despondent art. But almost all of the plays written and performed in the Jewish ghettos were comedies. 
Maybe at this point in my argument, you're raising the objection that humor doesn't necessarily conflate to optimism and that my example is ill-chosen. Uh, we tend to think of optimism and pessimism as being a matter of expectation, as in, do we expect bad things to happen or do we expect good things to happen? But these definitions are not useful. With rare exception, what we as human beings expect of the world has little bearing on what the world gives us. A more worthwhile definition of optimism and pessimism should, in my estimation, be tethered not to what we expect to happen next, but how we react to what has already happened. An optimist sees the bright side of how things have transpired, even if that bright side is something comically absurd, as it often is. A pessimist prefers to see the negative of what has happened. Those who laugh at Nazis are true optimists. Those who call the laughter insane are true pessimists. It seems that even in the most severe circumstances, human beings can find something to laugh about. Perhaps comedy is even easier to find in such circumstances. As Robin Williams said, for me, comedy starts as a spew, a kind of explosion. And then you sculpt it from there, if at all. It comes out of a deeper, darker side. Maybe it comes from anger, because I'm outraged by cruel absurdities, the hypocrisy that exists everywhere, even within yourself, where it's hardest to see. And while I'm quoting brilliant people to make myself seem smarter, I might as well throw a John Milton quote your way as well. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. That's from Paradise Lost and Milton's writing there as the devil who has just been cast into hell. Satan looks around his new surroundings, a hell, a place of misery and dread, and reaches the conclusion that it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. You could liken Lucifer's situation to a young adult who moves out of his parents' house and into a shitty apartment. In almost every way, the apartment may be inferior, but at least it's a domain where he can exercise a greater degree of control and freedom without the chiding of his mom and dad. At least in his apartment, he's the boss, as long as he stays quiet enough to not upset the neighbors and as long as he can manage to pay the rent. But let's also remember the fable from Aesop about the sour grapes. It goes like this. A hungry fox spots a delicious, juicy, wonderful batch of grapes up on a high vine. With great determination, he jumps and claws and tries with all of his might to reach them, but he can't. And when it becomes clear that the grapes are simply out of his reach and that no amount of effort will deliver them into his salivating maw, he says to himself, those grapes are probably sour anyway. We recognize ourselves in the fox because we also tend to lie to ourselves about that which we cannot have rather than admit that we are powerless. If we can't have that which we desire, we often convince ourselves that we don't, in fact, desire it. Humor and other forms of optimism serve as a defense against the suckiness of the world, but they are obviously limited in the protection they offer. Laughter raised Jewish spirits in a time of great turmoil, but it didn't protect them from the Nazi gas chambers. No amount of positive attitude or gallows humor could prevent the Zyklon B from turning rooms full of living Jews into rooms full of Jewish corpses. Lucifer can tell himself that with enough mental effort, he can make a heaven of hell, but it doesn't change the fact that he is in hell and no longer in heaven. The fox can pretend that the unreachable grapes are sour and undesirable, but they remain juicy and delicious. Ultimately, our mental efforts to stave off the suck only dull the pain. They cannot defeat it. Well, what about the things that don't suck? Well, they are hard to find. Even the most amazing and pleasurable thing comes with a list of downsides attached to it. Uh, take sex, for example. It is a thing that we are biologically compelled to pursue, for it's how our species reproduces, and reproduction is the closest thing that evolution has given us to a meaning or purpose. But even this primal need, 
and primal pleasure is marred with its own set of difficulties. There is unrequited attraction, known contemporarily as the friend zone, STDs, unwanted children, sexual predators, cheating, awkward moments of failure or embarrassment, underwhelming partners, unrealistic kinks, body image issues, and a whole host of other issues that one could uh, fill an entire book with. There's not a single aspect of life that I can think of that's 100% positive. A happy memory can make you feel sad because you're not in that moment any longer. Laughter can conceal a mountain of pain, as we've already examined a bit earlier. Even a smile can hurt your face after a while. Friends can betray you, family can disown you or control you too rigidly. Many of the best tasting foods are bad for you. Many of the decisions that gratify you in the moment will hurt you in the long run. In fairness, it's hard to think of things that are completely bad either. Even if you die a terrible death, it might at least mean your enemies are happy and your suffering is over. If your house burns down, you might get a big insurance check or the sympathy of your family and friends or both. If you go to prison, at least some of uh, some private prison company CEO somewhere is making a little more money. At least someone somewhere wins. Why does this equation seem so drastically lopsided? For every moment of pleasure, it seems that there are many moments of pain. For every minute of exhilaration, there are hours of boredom. For every person who lives in wealth and opulence, there are countless others who struggle to make ends meet or who live in abject poverty. Uh, for every lottery winner, there are millions of lottery losers. Oh, and let's not forget that no matter how much happiness you can fit into one lifetime, ultimately, one is all you get. When you're done, you will die. No matter what path you walked, there will be countless multitudes you did not. No matter what joys you experienced, there will always be many pleasures you never explored. No matter what accomplishments you achieved, so much of your potential was never realized. You will blink out of existence, and soon enough, even from memory, uh, even kings are eventually forgotten. Uh, one day the human race itself will die and the complete works of Shakespeare will be equal to the dirt of the ground. The universe doesn't value art. We do. The same can be said of all that we value. Once we're gone, it all reverts to meaninglessness for we are the arbiters of meaning and we are the creators of meaning and we are the inventors of God. God exists in our minds to give our concept of meaning weight beyond itself. That which we value, we will tell ourselves that it is not we alone who value it, but it's God who values it also. And whereas we are demonstrably mortal, God is eternal. Whereas we are limited in our powers, the powers of God are boundless. Whereas we are ignorant, God is all-knowing. Whereas we cannot fathom the true nature of existence, God is the architect of all that is, was, and will be. Whereas we cannot decide what has value and meaning, God is the master of value and meaning. Whether it is to be lamented or rejoiced, God is a concoction of the human mind. Through the processes of science, mathematics, and to a lesser extent philosophy, we have come to understand that God is a failed hypothesis. Whereas we are mortal, God never lived. Whereas we are limited in our powers, God is powerless. Whereas we are ignorant, God has never thought a single thought or known a single fact. Whereas we cannot fathom the nature of existence, God has never existed. Where does that leave value and meaning? There can be no God to give weight to it. Does it therefore have no weight? In a way, we are the God we've searched for. True, we lack his immortality, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his dominion over all of existence. But from a certain point of view, we have all of those things. We may not be immortal, but as the strange philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said, if we take eternity to mean not infinite temporal duration, but timelessness, then eternal life belongs to those who live in the present. We may not be all powerful, but we have within us the capacity to seek and expand power. We may not be all knowing, but we are learning creatures whose knowledge has expanded over time. We may not be the creators of the universe, but each of us lives qualitatively in a universe of our own perceptual assemblage. There is a reason 
why John Milton's Lucifer is a sympathetic character, because like us, he aspires to be God, but finds himself instead consigned to hell. God is the ultimate pinnacle of the aspirations of man. What we hunger for, he personifies. We struggle for power and self-determination, so we imagine God as an all-powerful being whose whims are law. We yearn for understanding, so we imagine God as knowing everything there is to know. We struggle to find meaning in existence, so we imagine God as the master of meaning. Not only can he identify that which has meaning, but he is the very source of said meaning, the absolute essence of it. Without God... We must accept the limits of our power, of our knowledge, and these are bitter pills to swallow. But not the most bitter. Centuries of being taught to humble ourselves before the divine has made us somewhat willing to accept our limitations, although it was always with the consolation that we were in the hands of the Almighty. The bitterest pill to swallow is the pill of meaning, Because even though every person has within them a system of values and meanings, without God, there is no objective metric by which to judge such things. Therefore, we must accept that what is meaningful to us has no meaning outside of us. We are the only authors of meaning known to exist. Earlier in this chapter, we briefly mentioned and then dismissed the famed philosophical question of, What is the meaning of life? My answer was glib. There isn't one. For the sake of clarifying what I'm talking about here, let's tackle the question a little more deeply. Like most questions in the realm of subjectivity, it can be answered from many different angles and from many different distances. If we are pulled all the way back and looking at the totality of all of existence, the question, what is the meaning of life, can be interpreted to mean... Look at all this life that fills the cosmos. What is the meaning of it all? And that's probably a question better left to science. The interpretation of the question that we will look at is this. In the context of this vast cosmos, this vast universe or perhaps multiverse, what is the value of human life? If there's a God presiding over the whole thing, then perhaps the value of human life is that we're the pet project of a bored deity. But no matter how far back we pan, we don't don't see a God. I could make an argument that even if there were a God, he would not necessarily be able to provide us with the meaning that we hunger for. But since I don't believe that he exists, I won't bother with that argument here. Without his presence... Uh, What does human life mean in the vastness of space and the vastness of time? Well, the planet that we occupy a fraction of the surface of is one planet out of 100 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe, which could be just one of 100 billion universes, for all we know. Uh, If our planet was wiped out tomorrow, the overall picture of the universe would not change in any noticeable way, nor would its continuing function be in any way impaired the universe existed for 13.7 billion years without us and it may exist for that long or longer after we're gone and never take note of our absence even if it had the capacity to notice our destruction it would not notice it any more than you notice a single cell of bacteria dying on your arm human life is of no value at this distance if we pan closer much closer to just the planet earth human life has some meaning we've lived on the surface of the world for 2000 centuries and we've surely been among its most dominant species not only have we traversed and colonized much of the earth's surface but we've repurposed its resources to suit ourselves we like milton's lucifer have done our best to make a heaven of hell On a cold day, it can be warm inside. On a hot day, it can be cool inside. We have special chairs for the crippled and injured that allow them mobility. We have food in abundance delivered to our doorstep if we want it. We have endless entertainment options at our fingertips for a reasonable price. We have, through science and technology, made ever greater strides towards godhood. We may not be all powerful, but we can split the atom. We may not be all knowing, but we carry vast compendiums of knowledge around in our pockets. Yet strides toward meaning elude us. 
You cannot discover meaning via a scientific process. You cannot engineer and manufacture meaning. If anything, the greater the strides we have made towards power and knowledge, the further we have moved away from meaning. But just as Aesop's fox hungered for the unreachable grapes, we hunger for the unreachable meaning of life. So should we, like the fox, simply lie to ourselves and say, the meaning is probably sour anyway? Or should we continue to strive for meaning and hope that some miracle of effort will produce a seemingly impossible result? From the perspective of the earth, the answer to the meaning of human life is elusive. It's something we hunger for, strive for, or even convince ourselves that we have found. But if we zoom in one final time into the mind of one human being, such as yourself, we can find yet another meaning of life. To an artist, art is meaningful. To a businessman, business is meaningful. To a drug addict, their drug of choice is meaningful. To a vain person, their looks are meaningful. To a smart person, their intelligence is meaningful. Everyone has values. Even the most deplorable human beings to exist have something that they find value and meaning in. Albert Fish, the notorious sadomasochistic serial killer, believed that torturing, killing, and eating children was a divine experience that pleased the Christian God. Many Christians don't share that view of God, but they may not be as far removed as they imagine. Mother Teresa took in massive amounts of money under the auspices of helping the poor and the sick, but what she offered them was little more than an overcrowded hovel in which to suffer and die. The money she collected didn't go to medicine for the sick, but into the deep pockets of the Catholic Church. And this was justified by Teresa by her belief that there is a profound beauty in suffering that God loves. In Amsterdam, there is a famous museum called the Rijksmuseum. And there you can find an abundance of old Christian art, mostly from the 14th through 17th centuries. One thing that's very striking about uh, Christian art is that it's all very joyless and grim, full of stern and sad faces, bloody scenes of crucifixion, decapitated heads, cripples, infanticide, and so on. The one Bible scene in the entire museum that seems remotely to be joyful is a painting of a drunken lot about to be raped by his own daughters, and that's not exactly the happiest tale in existence. Uh, to me, these images are too joyless and barren to be of interest, but to Christians, there is something captivating in them. Like Albert Fish and Mother Teresa, many Christians see a divine beauty in suffering, and from that suffering, they derive meaning. It is not difficult to understand when you remember that Christianity was born out of the imagination of an oppressed people who lived in poverty. Instead of seeking the power to escape from poverty... They created a religion that extolled poverty, that said that the meek would inherit the earth, that said that it was easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Christianity is truly the religion of Milton's Lucifer, for their goal is the same, to make a heaven of hell using only the power of their minds. Nonetheless, there is a difference. Lucifer made a heaven of hell by declaring that it was better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. The Christians made a heaven of hell by convincing themselves that hell was just heaven's waiting room, and that if they accept their terrible lot in life with grace and humility, then paradise would await them in the next life. If you ask a Christian the meaning of life, they are apt to say that life is a test, a series of trials to see if your soul is worthy of joining God in heaven. You pass this test when you accept the validity of Christian mythology as fact and personally submit yourself to Jesus Christ and to his Father God. In other words, it's a game where the object is to be gullible. Now, we live in times when it's harder and harder to be gullible enough to fall for the blatant deceits of Christianity. Throughout the Western world, atheistic thought has been on the rise for decades and has exploded in the information age. Uh, the serpent in the Garden of Eden told Adam and Eve that if they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, they would be as God. And God told them something else. He told them that they would surely die if they ate the fruit. Though I see the story only as allegory, I can liken it easily to the subject matter here. 
The question I'd like to answer is, who was lying? Was it God or was it the devil? It seems to me that they were both lying and both telling the truth. Knowledge has brought man closer and closer to becoming his own god, but it's also disconnected him from the bliss of his ignorance. No creature but man must contend with the existential crisis, uh, must agonize over meaning, must imagine gods to comfort him, must invent lies to shield him from the harshness of reality. The serpent of Eden was right when he said that biting from the tree of knowledge would make us like God. And the more godlike we have become, the less need we have for the God of old. But God was right as well, because in a way, we have also died. We are dying spiritually as we realize the fallacious nature of spirituality and begin to recognize that it's something that exists within us and not outside of us. We have lost our spirituality and our naivete, but we have not lost our hunger for meaning. It was a hunger that was once sated on the fruits of God, but in 1882, our good friend Friedrich Nietzsche saw that the Enlightenment had killed God. Since Nietzsche's 1882 declaration that God is dead, there have been many attempts to bring God back to life, including Jordan Peterson's most recent attempts at resuscitation. But God has not come back to life. He's only gotten deader. Like Aesop's fox, we can no longer reach the fruit. Nietzsche sought to fill the gap left by God's death with art and with culture. But art can never be for mankind what God was. Art can be criticized. Art can be taken or left. Art can be ignored. Art is the product of fallible man. And we have seen in light of the recent Me Too campaign that many artists are terribly fallible and broken human beings. Great art can be transcendent, but it's never divine. God, for mankind, was an explanation for why we suffer, but also a promise to end suffering. God was a stern father who loved us, but whose judgments were harsh. God was a force that could not be challenged, could not be trifled with, could not be disobeyed without consequence. God was a king who would reign forever, even as the kingdoms of man fell to ruin and to dust. And no matter how much modern apologists like Jordan Peterson wish for the dominion of God to once again preside over man, it's unlikely to happen. We've come too far into Godhood to see God. We have climbed too high on the Tower of Babel, and we can now see that heaven is empty, that the throne of God is nowhere, and that the souls of the dead likely have no destination other than oblivion. It took us more than a century to widely accept what Nietzsche knew in 1882, that God is dead. But we have still barely begun to deal with the greatest ramification of that statement. It's not just that God is dead, it's that meaning is dead. We will never again find meaning as we found in God. We will not find it in art or in science or in any other endeavor. The reason why is simple. Meaning was always a trick of the mind. Once you know how the trick works, you cannot be fooled with it again. Happily, there are advantages to the death of meaning. Foremost, without an outwardly defined meaning, we are free to make our own meaning. This is at the core of my definition of optimistic nihilism. We are not constrained by a god that was given to us by society, but we are instead our own gods and may make determinations for ourselves. Uh, we must still exist within a social contract, but within the freedoms of society, we can choose our own destiny or at least aim for it. If you don't find solace in that, you can at least take comfort in knowing that with the rejection of objective meaning, all that you've really lost is yet another potent delusion that was only misguiding you. Every child reaches an age where she no longer believes in Santa Claus and begins to understand that there is no magic in the world. Uh, the presents beneath the tree are not made by elves in the North Pole, but by Hasbro and Sony. The presents are not delivered by a fat immortal who commands flying reindeer, but by a pudgy UPS driver. Humanity is beginning to reach a similar age where the Santa Claus for adults, God, has been debunked as a myth, even though 
we still have the same presence that God gave us, a sense of spirituality and a sense of meaning, they no longer seem as magical underneath the tree. The presence are still just as present, but the context of them is no longer as exciting, no longer as dramatic and magical. So my answer to Chelsea's question is this. We are a species that is leaving the innocence of childhood and emerging into the confusion of adolescence. We are, as a species, facing an existential crisis. We are no longer naive enough to justify our own existence. We no longer believe that our suffering is a path to anything better. We no longer believe that our purpose is written in stone. And we don't yet know how to deal with that. Some say we must live for ourselves. Some say we must live for others. Some say we should not live at all. Some say we must live to create art or build empires or accrue wealth or any number of other things. Some say we must turn back to God. Some say we must reinvent God, essentially giving him a slick Hollywood reboot. Uh, this diversity of opinion is the chaos in which new ideas are born, as we discussed in chapter one, but they are also a clamor that is so deafening that you can't cannot hear yourself think sometimes. We are presented with many paths, but none are the right path because there is no right path. The challenge of our place and time is this. How do we feel the firm conviction that we have chosen the right path when we know that there is no right path? How do we stand firm in our ideals when we know that they are subjective and that they are worth no more or less than the ideals of those we absolutely despise? How do we bear the indignities and heartaches of life when we see so clearly that our suffering amounts to nothing and means nothing, that we exist not not because it's the will of something greater, but that we exist simply because we exist. Everything sucks because we don't have good answers to those questions. Life has always contained its fair amount of suffering, but we once had a comforting lie to protect us from the true context of that suffering. Now that the lie is losing credibility, we have lost our shield. And just as Adam and Eve realized that they were naked before God, we have realized that we are naked in the cold cruelty of uncaring existence. This prospect can terrify us and fills us with dread. However, it can also be a gift if we see that in acceptance of meaninglessness there is the potential to experience a freedom unlike anything we have yet experienced. Will we explore the new terrain of meaningless existence or will we cling ever more desperately to a delusion of meaning? This is the choice we face. Which is the correct path? That's completely up to you. Chapter 4 why don't nihilists just kill themselves? Ever since I began to self-identify as a nihilist, first timidly and then brashly, I have heard several misconceptions about what nihilism entails. And I've also gotten quite an earful about what sort of conduct I should display if I'm really a nihilist. These characterizations are often cartoonishly over the top in nature, taking the form of statements like, if you're a nihilist, why don't you just kill yourself? If everything is pointless, why even live? I could point out that killing myself would be just as pointless as anything else, but that would perhaps be too glib a response. We're in the midst right now of a suicide epidemic. Suicide is up 30% over the last 20 years across the United States. And it's not just a U.S. problem, it's a global problem. Suicide is the second leading cause of death globally for people between the ages of 15 and 29. The suicide rate of students in the U.K. rose 56% from 2007 to 2016. Japan, despite being a much smaller country than the U.S., has about the same number of suicides annually. What's really puzzling to a lot of experts is that here in the United States, 54% of people who commit suicide had no diagnosed mental health condition prior to killing themselves. Uh, depression is a factor, anxiety is a factor, drugs are a factor, and experts look at all of these. But what is often ignored because it's more difficult to discuss in an objective and empirical way is the philosophical dimension of suicide, the beliefs about the world that might lead one to make the decision to end their own life. 
I was speaking yesterday with a close friend who has struggled with suicidal feelings throughout their life, and they were talking to me about religion. They were once a very religious person, but now they're an atheist. What they told me is that when they were religious, they still felt suicidal, but suicide didn't seem like an option. They were always taught by their elders that suicide was nothing more than a one-way ticket to hell, and that anyone who ends their own life cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they were instructed that suicide would not save them from suffering, but only increase it dramatically. Religion did not alleviate the suffering they felt from depression or anxiety, but simply created the variable of eternal torment in hell. This hell variable made the option of suicide less appealing, but with traditional religion on the, the decline, the threat of hell's flames rings ever more hollow. And one consequence is that suicide is back on the table as a rational choice to alleviate the plethora of pains associated with human existence. As I said earlier, I consider myself to be a nihilist. And for every person like me who identifies themselves as a nihilist, there are countless others who are nihilists, but who have never thought to self-apply the label, either because they're not familiar with the word or they don't know what it means. Uh, the essence of nihilism is the belief that existence is meaningless. And I think that it would be foolish to deny that there is a nihilistic component to suicide. To kill yourself, you have to reach the point of looking at your pain and your struggle and saying, resisting the urge to end my existence is meaningless. My struggles are meaningless. My pain is meaningless. Uh, there's no reason for me to continue to exist in this miserable state. There's no reason not to end at all. Perhaps it is in the spirit of combating this nihilistic despair that people attack the very concept of nihilism, uh, painting it in the two-dimensional manner I described earlier. However, those who attack nihilism never do seem to counter it in a substantive way. They say something akin to, you are mistaken to believe that existence is without meaning. But never do they say, here is a cogent definition of meaning, and here is proof that it is present in the universe. The only thing that these pseudo-optimists have got is a lot of empty platitudes about the beauty of life, all of which ring hollow to me. Otherwise, they have a delusional fantasy of a god who presides over the whole of existence and who will mete out rewards and punishments in the afterlife depending on our conduct and beliefs as mortal beings. Friedrich Nietzsche, the edgiest philosopher ever, postulated that nihilism would ultimately have a deeply corrosive effect on society, that it would undermine all of our moral convictions, our religious convictions, our spiritual convictions, and that we would find ourselves mired in an era of rudderless existential suffering, fatigue, and indifference. He also noted that nihilism creates within many of us a desire for destruction, a desire to see the slate wiped clean. Perhaps you have seen the bumper stickers and t-shirts from 2016 uh, that read, Giant Meteor 2016 just ended already. They're already reappearing in 2020 with nothing changed but the year. This is an example of a nihilistic urge towards ultimate destruction. Just as a suicidal nihilist longs to end their own suffering with personal destruction, a destructive nihilist seeks to end all suffering with the eradication of all sentient life on this planet. Now, there's a sense of humor to the giant meteor slogan, obviously, but like most humor, there is an underlying truth. In this case, it's the truth of nihilism, the very same truth that infests the mind of the suicidal person, the truth that none of our struggles are going to culminate in a different outcome other than death, and that the totality of our human experiences are as meaningless as the mutterings of a Pentecostal idiot writhing on the floor, gibbering in tongues. Uh, in that circumstance, it's easy to draw the conclusion that we would be better off dead than lost in this frustration and confusion and suffering and despair. 
Some thinkers who have recognized this problem, like recently popular academic Jordan Peterson, have prescribed to us a cure for this state of affairs, a return to the bosom of comforting delusion. We must rediscover God. Nietzsche said God is dead. Well, then we must find a way to bring him back to life. We must reconnect with the traditions of our ancestors and reset the clock to a time when meaning was king and not just an antiquated notion from a bygone era. People are looking backwards because the way forward is too fraught with existential peril. I believe this urge is part of the driving force behind Donald Trump's regressive Make America Great Again slogan. People want to be returned to a time when things made sense. They fail to realize that the past only makes sense in hindsight. I question whether the Jordan Peterson approach is possible, and I reject outright the notion that it is desirable. Life has no reset button that you can press to return to a previous state. I need look no further than myself for the reason why a return to God is unlikely. In the absence of any new evidence for God, I could no more become a Christian than I could sprout wings and fly. In fact, with the forward march of technology and the rise of transhumanism, it's far more likely that I will one day have wings than it is that I will one day worship the God of the Bible. Even most of those who do evoke the name of God struggle to believe in him. Even famous religious figures like Mother Teresa, it turns out, found it difficult to maintain their blind faith. Even Jordan Peterson, who prescribes a return to God as a solution to our current struggles with postmodernistic thought, can't give a straight answer to the simple question of, do you believe in God? So okay. people often ask me, do you believe in God? Which I don't, I don't like that question. First of all, it's an attempt to, to, it's an attempt to box me in, in a sense. And the reason that it's an attempt to box me in is because the question is asked so that I can be firmly placed on one side of a two, of a binary argument. And, and the reason I don't like to answer it is because A, I don't like to be boxed in, and B, because I don't know what the person means by believe or God, and they think they know. And the probability that they construe belief and construe God the same way I do is virtually zero. So it's, it's a question that doesn't work for me on multiple levels of analysis. He goes on like that for 10 minutes. Define God. Define believe. Define do. Define you. Define the question mark at the end of the sentence. All of a sudden. When faced with this very simple binary choice, he turns into that which he claims to oppose, a postmodernist. Every definition is in question. No word means anything stable or static. I find it remarkable that a man who says that the only true atheist is a murdering, raping savage can't bring himself to just say yes or no when asked directly about his belief in God. He wants to sidestep the burden of proof if he says yes and sidestep his own obvious atheism if he says no. So instead of a cogent answer to a direct question, we get a massive helping of Jordan Peterson word salad with liquefied bullshit as the dressing. Now let's return to the topic of suicide. This will be easy for me, as contemplating Peterson's odious stupidity can certainly stir, stir some suicidal thoughts. According to a Harris poll from 2016, only about one in three Americans consider themselves happy at present, meaning that two-thirds are not happy. Not all of those unhappy people get addicted to meth or opioids or alcohol. Not all of those unhappy people will take their own lives. However, all of those unhappy people are at greater risk for those self-destructive behaviors. I speak as someone who has, for the last six years or so, struggled with a self-destructive affinity for tobacco. I wake up many mornings coughing until I'm lightheaded, and I wonder why I continue to do this to myself. 
But I need not wonder because the answer is obvious. Uh, It's that I am one of the two thirds of my countrymen who are unhappy. And I ultimately see no inherent value in my own existence, nor do I see inherent value in the existence of others. Despite this, I have never, or at least very rarely, felt genuinely suicidal. I have formed some self-destructive habits, uh, but I do struggle against them to some extent, despite my perception that the struggle is ultimately meaningless. I have not prevailed over these failings, but I do put forth some effort, however inadequate it may be. So when someone says, if you are a nihilist, then why don't you just kill yourself? My response to them is that I don't want to kill myself. If I did wish to kill myself and that wish were sustained over an adequate duration of time that I knew it was not merely a passing phase, then I would seriously consider the prospect of doing so. I must admit, suicide can be a comforting thought. When the world becomes too stupid to tolerate, I remind myself that there is an exit. There is a way out. There is a way to end this mortal experience and all that it entails. Then I also remind myself of this. Death is inevitable. We cannot bargain death away. We cannot buy immortality. We cannot avoid falling under the reaper's scythe. I find solace in this truth. The destruction of every negative thing that permeates my existence will one day be alleviated by my inevitable death and good riddance to it. However, by willfully ending my existence prematurely, I am robbing myself of a great deal of positive experiences and also the chance for personal growth. I might be a miserable 34-year-old, but perhaps I will be a joyful 45-year-old. I'll never know if I don't persist. And if I fail completely and my life is nothing but unremittent misery, then death will still come to allay my ennui. I've lost nothing by continuing to exist. I've merely prolonged my suffering by a few years or decades that amount to basically nothing on the scale of cosmic time. I have abandoned notions of objective meaning, objective morality, divine or innate order, and many of the other ideological flourishes of the human animal that we like to imagine are truths, but are really only fabrications propagated as memes and passed down through the generations, usually for pragmatic reasons such as social cohesion. There are a number of human concepts that are part of what I like to think of as the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities, which I guess I better explain. It's important to note as we explore this pyramid that I am not attempting to order these interdependent subjectivities in terms of how they should be prioritized. I'm instead ordering them based on how true they are perceived to be by the general populace with those perceived as the most true near the base of the pyramid and those perceived as the least true near the top. And even then it's a very loose order. At the base of the pyramid is so-called objective truth that which can be directly observed and or empirically tested. Critical thinkers know that even this level of the pyramid is open to scrutiny. New evidence may lead to a different understanding of reality tomorrow. There are certain assumptions that we must make to even believe in an objective reality. We must assume that Natural causes exist for things that happen in the world around us. We must assume that evidence can be used to learn about those causes. We must assume that there is consistency in the causes that occur in the world. And the biggest assumption of all is the assumption that the world is real and that we are all suited on some level to perceive its reality. We must also understand the limits of science, recognizing that there could be explanations of observable phenomena that we haven't thought of or that we are incapable of imagining. There could also be phenomena that exist for which no observable evidence exists. And of course, despite our best efforts, human biases have not been entirely removed from the scientific process. In some cases, they inherently cannot be removed from the process, such as in many of these so-called soft sciences like psychology, sociology, anthropology, archaeology, etc. So at the base of the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities, uh, there is what we think of as objective or scientific truth. We tend to ignore the caveats I have mentioned and proceed as though what science shows us is immutable and beyond reproach. 
I agree that scientific truth is the closest we can come to perceiving and understanding so-called objective reality, but we cannot justify our absolute faith in its objectivity. We are ultimately just primates trying to make peace with the subjective nature of reality by pretending that rationality and empiricism have delivered us from the chaos and uncertainty of our biased brains and their unproven and perhaps unprovable assumptions. On the next level of the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities, we have the mystical truths. These are the truths for which no concrete evidence exists, yet many believe them anyway. A mystical truth might take the form of religion or spiritualism or of so-called objective morality or any other number of um, truths that are not tethered to any sort of empirical evidence but are instead based firmly on instinct, desire, or social pressure. A human being might get it into their head that if they behave in a certain manner and they hold certain beliefs, they will survive their own death and inherit a paradise in the afterlife. Uh, this is a mystical truth. A gambler might convince himself that he has a lucky number, a number that is likely to win him money on the roulette wheel. This is a mystical truth. Uh, there are countless examples, but a quick and easy definition of a mystical truth is a truth that is believed as fact, but for which no empirical evidence exists. On the next level of the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities, we have socially pragmatic truth. These are the truths that are not necessarily looked at as facts, but are viewed as being vital and necessary to preserve the social order of any given society. It's very important to recognize that certain truths can fall onto this level of the pyramid or the level below it, depending on the nature of the individual believer. For instance, a person might believe that rape is wrong because it is inherently a negative act and that the cosmos itself somehow regards it as such. For this person, the immorality of rape is a mystical truth, not a socially pragmatic truth. Another person might believe that rape is wrong, not because the cosmos itself or God or whatever has decreed it to be so, but because rape is damaging to the social fabric. For this person, the immorality of rape is a socially pragmatic truth and not a mystical truth. What you can take away from this is that whether any given position is a mystical truth or a socially pragmatic truth is often contingent not on the belief itself, but on the reasoning behind the belief. Even belief in God can, for some people, be a socially pragmatic truth rather than a mystical truth. Uh, there are those who view belief in a religious dogma as a useful social adhesive, something that serves the practical purpose of maintaining the cohesion of a society by giving people a shared belief from which they derive a common morality and a sense of belonging. Uh, these people admit that such beliefs are irrational on an evidentiary level, but still think that such beliefs are justified by the positive impact they can have on society. On a personal note, I'd like to say that anyone who, hold, who holds uh, such views is an idiot. Religion has clearly been a divisive and stunting force for our species, but we will discuss that uh, more in depth in a later chapter. The next level of the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities is ego truth. These are beliefs and ideas that are recognized intellectually to be subjective, but are emotionally given the weight of truth. For example, I am quite passionate about film, and I believe that my taste in film is superior to the taste of those around me. So if I say that Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai is a masterpiece and someone else says that it is boring drivel, I am going to regard that person as a complete idiot and perhaps even ostracize them. Intellectually, I recognize that film taste is subjective, but emotionally, I am treating my own taste as though it were a higher truth and should be regarded with greater deference than uh, the ego truths of others. Many of us hold on to a great many ego truths, uh, truths that are true for us on a personal level, and so we extrapolate that truth to the world outside of ourselves, even as we recognize, at least on some level, that we are committing a fallacy. These truths are essentially opinions that we recognize as opinions, but hold so dearly that we treat them as facts. 
Uh, we feel that they are representative of us on such a deep level that disagreement with them is tantamount to an attack on our ego and the validity of our perceptions. Finally, at the top of the pyramid of interdependent subjectivities, we have opinions. These are the subjectivities that we recognize as subjective on both an emotional and intellectual level. They tend to be very minor things like ice cream flavor preference, favorite color, favorite smell, things of that nature. One might believe that black licorice is a disgusting candy, but it's unlikely that one would think less of someone else for liking it or feel that their ego is being attacked or assaulted if someone holds the belief that black licorice is delicious, which, by the way, it is. The fundamental goal of my nihilism is to recognize and accept subjectivity for what it is, to root out delusional notions of truth and to come to terms with what I perceive to be the, the chaotic and disjointed nature of experiential reality. The human psyche hungers for certainty and for order. Uh, parasites like Jordan Peterson prey on this hunger, selling to confused people the notion that by embracing his idea of order and rejecting the chaos of postmodernistic thought, they can attain a more contented state of being and preserve a more stable social order. Peterson is not alone, of course. Many of Peterson's detractors are every bit as prone as Peterson to fetishize order and vilify chaos. They object not to Peterson's upholding of order, but rather to the nature of his order. They might say something akin to, Peterson desires a conservative social order contingent on personal responsibility? Nonsense! We desire a liberal social order contingent upon equality and social justice. Ironically, both Peterson and his detractors in fighting for competing visions of order are unwittingly servants of beautiful chaos. The chasm between your idea of order and another person's idea of order is always filled with chaos, is always confusion, is always societal schizophrenia, a car being pulled down two paths at once when a fork appears in the road. The gorgeous thing about nihilism is that from it you can proceed in any direction. Nietzsche reasoned that as we embrace nihilism, it would consign us necessarily to a path of misery. And while I agree that it has done so, I think he was wrong to think that it must do so. I will attempt to explain myself. In a recent video I made about the horrible attack on, in Christchurch, New Zealand, which claimed the lives of 49 people, someone uh, commented that I was making a lot of moral pronouncements for someone who identifies as a nihilist. Uh, this is, to my way of thinking, an incorrect assessment of nihilism. I don't think that nihilism precludes the existence of a moral code, though morality is not what I choose to label my system of ethics. I think nihilism merely forces us into the admittedly uncomfortable terrain of accepting that our moral precepts are as subjective as our taste in films, or our food preferences, or the music we like. In other words, morality is just a matter of opinion. Traditionally, this idea has been called moral relativism, which is opposed to objective morality as espoused by most religious and even some secular philosophers. Those who believe in objective morality, I refuse to take seriously until they can demonstrate what specific objective morals exist and how we can determine their objectivity. For more on this subject, you can revisit Chapter 2, The Art of Morality. Moral relativism itself is branched into two factions or two schools of thought individual relativism and cultural relativism. Individual relativism states that an individual can create his or her own mor moral code and live by that, whereas cultural relativism says that one's society will dictate morality through whatever political means exist in said society, be they uh, democratic or authoritarian or whatever. For an example of how individual relativism and cultural relativism have the capacity to confront and change one another, let us briefly revisit the example from chapter one of Martin Luther King Jr. and his struggle for equal rights in a racist country that condemned him and his people to second-class citizen status on the basis of their ethnicity. 
this was an example of the culturally uh, relative morality of uh, codified racism opposing the individually relative morality of Dr. King and his acolytes who demanded equality. Or even more accurately, it was a battle between the culturally relative notion of codified racism versus the subculturally relative morality of equality regardless of ethnicity. These forces, however you wish to categorize them, clashed in a major way throughout the 1960s, and this clash culminated in a new cultural morality uh, on anti-racism, of anti-racism, where espousing racism is one of the greatest possible taboos. Thanks in large part to the civil rights movement, it is now the racists who are treated like second-class citizens. Our conflicts, whether they be small interpersonal disputes or tribal battles for ideological supremacy, are competing visions of order who duke it out in the arena of chaos. Chaos brings forth change, whether that change represents new ideas or old ones trying to come back. Uh, It's the job of order to implement and codify those changes, to make them the new status quo until another surge of chaos challenges that status quo, and then the victor of that battle will determine whether the old status quo will remain or a new one will take its place. It's very important to me to understand how these social forces interact and how they depend on one another, uh, with chaos being the agent of new creation and order being the defender of those creations but only after it has fought tooth and nail against them and lost. To my way of thinking, a society that is free from pain and suffering is not the ultimate utopia. You can achieve uh, an end to suffering with a gun to the head on an individual level or a giant meteor on a collective level. That is not desirable for a species built to survive, built to build, built to climb the ladder of complexity to zeniths not yet dreamed of by even the most starry-eyed futurists. Uh, Endings are boring, but plot twists that no one ever saw coming are exhilarating, even when they're terrifying. So I don't yearn for an end to pain. I yearn for a society where pain is seen as an opportunity to grow and change, where unrest is a portent not of doom, but of rebirth. A true utopia is a society that embraces chaos and order, each in their own measure, and understands the value of each on not just an intellectual level, but on a visceral one. We live in an age of ever-increasing chaos because we live in an age of ever-increasing social complexity. Those who cannot adjust to the rapidity of change will find themselves ever more deranged by what they perceive as the instabilities of the world around them. For conservative-minded people, this derangement will mount as their jobs are stolen by machines, their cultural identities are destroyed by immigration, their traditional concepts of things like gender are challenged by an increasingly vocal transgender community, their concepts of family are assaulted by gay marriage and other atypical family configurations, and their familiar economic systems are transformed by both automation and an ascendant population left that is unmistakably making strides towards a post-capitalist future. This is just the beginning of their unrest, however, because if they're scared of transgender people today, one can only imagine how they're going to react when transhumanism really begins to coalesce into the vibrant social movement that I predict it will become. If these conservatives are terrified of someone with a Y chromosome getting breast implants and a surgically constructed vagina, then they're going to be absolutely beset with grief when they are then expected to acknowledge the augmented intelligence 200 IQ winged zebra man with lasers in his fingers, a hydraulic two-headed penis, and a nanobot-assisted high-tech artificial heart that will last 1,000 years before needing to be replaced. The world is only getting stranger, and for those who yearn for traditional values and a time when things made sense, there is going to be nothing for them but bitterness and derangement. The progressive-minded person will also continue to face a plethora of challenges associated with the complex world that we are all expected to navigate somehow. 
For one, they will have to deal with an increasingly deranged and upset faction of traditionalist conservatives who will only become more radicalized as society changes at an increasingly rapid pace. Progressives will also find that navigating the intersectionality of the veritable ocean of new identities and ideologies that will emerge to be a chore of immense mental taxation. The traditionalists will be somewhat spared this adventure by roundly condemning this chaos and all that it represents. But for those who live amidst the chaos, it will be like navigating the world's most complicated maze, wearing a blindfold and being constantly told that you're going the wrong way by everyone else around you. It'll be a nightmare of confusion and disarray. Some will become frustrated and retreat into the welcoming arms of the traditionalists. I'm, of course, venturing into the realm of predicting the future here, and the fallacy of those who predict the future is that they tend to to, to do it by exaggerating their view of the present. I've certainly committed that fallacy in this instance, but failing a black swan event that is totally unforeseeable, I think that this is very much how our future will play out. Uh, To your right, increasingly radical traditionalists who are in abject terror at what the world is becoming, and to your left, the undiluted insanity of seemingly infinite, incongruent subcultures trying to navigate a social minefield without anything in common but their contempt for their traditionalist antagonists. If my vision of the future is correct, how do you find a path through it? The answer is surprisingly simple. Alistair Crowley formulated it in 1904 when he wrote, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He's referring here not to satiating every impulse towards hedonism, though he certainly was a hedonist, but towards following what he called your true will. Whatever path you find yourself called to walk, you should walk. And if that path creates chaos, then so be it. If it creates order, so be it. If it leads to nowhere, so be it. In an infinite and unsolvable maze located in a nihilistic and uncaring universe, there is no justification to call any path forward wrong. So you can walk any path self-assuredly, but just be sure it's the path you truly wish to walk. And if you are obstructed, then do all you can to destroy or subvert the obstacle. If you should be destroyed or imperiled, accept it with the fervor of a zealot who knows that all paths ultimately lead to obliteration. Critics of this worldview will no doubt summon up the specter of Hitler or some other notorious monster of human history. Should Hitler have walked his own path, his path led to the destruction of six million lives. Well, let me first say that if a new Hitler emerges, he or she will be an acolyte of order, not a child of chaos. He or she will represent a violent attempt to restore the world to a former state, and he or she will be followed by those who share his or her regressive desire for a return to a simpler time. For the children of chaos, there will be no Hitler. There may be the occasional Charles Manson, but such figures will fail to accrue a large enough following to achieve despotism of any kind. They will be operating in too disparate and fractured a social order to accumulate Hitler-esque levels of power. If this future I predict does not come to pass, then you can disregard this portion of the book. Nonetheless, as you proceed through the world, know that nihilism need not chain you to despair. It can be a force of immense liberation, freeing you to explore avenues of being that your shackled to doctrine ancestors couldn't even have conceived of. To be a fully actualized nihilist is to realize that you have the power to walk any path you choose. Suicide is just about the lamest thing you could do with such a power. It's my belief that anyone who can overcome fear enough to shoot themselves in the head can also overcome fear enough to walk the path they truly long for. Whatever holds you back, reject it. If family stands in your way, disown them. If society stands in your way, burn it down. If you're at war with yourself, pick a side and kill the part of you that's causing you to hesitate. Whatever excuse you're making right now, reject it. Nothing matters. So it doesn't matter if you fail, and success is whatever you want it to be. This means you have no excuse not to try. 
You may find that your own mind is chaos and that even you do not know what path you truly desire. However, even in this circumstance, I'm willing to bet that you at least know the path that you don't wish to walk. So don't allow the paralysis of indecision to default you onto a boring path laid out for you uh, by the expectations of those who imagine that they are your peers or by the machinations of those who think that they are your masters. Children of chaos, go forth and fuck shit up.